Okay, so you guys might remember that we were in the middle of the chapter where Caroline had had an infected leg after the rat bite and there was something wrong with Luna who wouldn't come out and eat or be a part of the group either. She tried to go back under the couch but I scooped her gently into my arms. Can you hand me the Bactine and the Neosporin? I asked Astrid. She handed them to me silently. That's a girl, I said to the dog. We'll get these cuts healed up now, good girl. I put some more ointment on the worst of the scratches. They looked red, more red than Caroline's bite wounds, but I didn't really know what else to do. I'd sat on the floor for so long, my knees were creaky when I stood up. I turned and faced Astrid. She was just looking at me with this weird look on her face. You're a good guy, she said. Her voice sounded kind of hollow. Yeah, I answered. She laughed. It was a dry, self-deprecating -depre chuckle. My mum said that when she met my dad, she literally heard like a bell ringing and she had the thought, this is a good guy, like she had this sudden recognition. I nodded. I didn't stop her from dating a long stream of bad guys, I tell you that. Your parents got divorced? My parents never even married. She couldn't take it, how nice he was. Oh, I said. The conversation didn't seem like it was going my way. Why do you think Jake left? She asked, suddenly changing the subject. Uh, I think he wanted to help Brayden. He felt bad that when Brayden got shot, he couldn't do more. Yeah, I know why he left the store originally. He was being a big hero, going out scouting, going on a big stupid mission. There was bitterness in her voice. She was talking about Jake with her usual toughness, but I could almost hear how hurt Astrid had, had, was under the sar sarcasm. But after he showed us on the video walkie-talkie thing that the hospital was closed, why didn't he come back? I don't know, I told her. I'll tell you why, she said, because he only ever thinks about himself. That's the kind of guy I pick. Tears started to trickle down her cheeks. He doesn't even know, she spat, about the baby. Oh, what's wrong with me? I'm just totally falling apart. She wiped the tears roughly with the back of her hand. And where are the other guys? Have they made it? Shouldn't they be in Denver by now? Why hasn't anyone come back for us? She sank down to sit on the futon. She was really crying now. I didn't know what to do. So I sat down too and hugged her. It seemed like the right thing to do. It seemed like she needed someone to hold her. I don't think I was taking advantage. Her soft body felt so warm in my arms. I hoped I wasn't taking advantage. Astrid, I know. It's horrible. It's all horrible. Lame. She sobbed and I held her closer. I feel like I'm going crazy. She wept into my shirt. Listen, Astrid, if I were you, I'd feel the same way, I told her. We've lost everything and we don't know what's going to happen to us. And if all that wasn't enough, you're pregnant. You're pregnant, Astrid. You have to give yourself a break. You really do. She looked up at me, wet lashes, reddish nose, her beautiful face just inches away from mine. She reached up with her fingertips. She straightened my glasses. I could feel her breath on my lips. She looked into my eyes. And then Chloe and Henry came in, arms full of Lego bins stacked three high. What's wrong, Astrid? Henry said. Are you sad? Don't cry. He came over to us, pushed me aside and wriggled onto her lap wrapping his skinny, freckled arms around her neck. Yeah, Chloe added, quit crying. She emptied a Lego bin onto the floor. We've got a Lego wall to do, and it's not going to build itself. Chapter 6, Alex. Mornings outside go like this. You're in the dark, and it looks like night. Like a very dark night, with no moon at all. But this part of your brain is on a timer, waiting for the sky to get light at the edge. That kind of muddy, grey sky before it even gets light. You're just waiting for that, and waiting for it, and it never comes. For my watch, I knew it was 6.07am, but it was dark, dark, dark. Morning was never coming, it seemed. Nico was feeling better, thank God. He got everyone up except for Josie. She was still out cold. Braden seemed the same as before. Still not really conscious, but not dead either. Sahalia kept, kept squeezing a little bit of Gatorade into his mouth every once in a while. Sahalia, Batiste and I had to get out and push the bus out of the ravine. The ground was very muddy with slime on it from the decaying leaves and grasses. Nico was mad that Sahalia, Batiste and I had our masks off, but really, it's impossible to hear what anyone says with them on. At least when we talked to him or the little kids, one side of the conversation could be understood. And of course, <clears throat> we weren't the best choice to push the bus, but even Nico had to agree that we were the right ones, since we were all type B. We rocked and rocked that bus. The wheels had a thin layer of the white fuzzy mould on them, but it didn't seem to matter. Eventually the bus rolled forward and got traction on some underbush. We got back on. Ugh, Sahalia said, wiping some muck off the front of her top layer. 
a men's windbreaker, probably five sizes too big. It wrecks out there. I think it's the decayed vegetation, I told her. Whatever geek, she said as she plopped herself down next to Brayden. If two, if we were two, if we two were the last two people on earth, not by the way as statistically implausible as it was a month ago, she would still be rude to me and I would still pretend, pretend that it didn't bother me. Nico drove. We were driving along the bottom of the ditch parallel to the highway. The hill we'd slid down was not too high, I would estimate 15 to 20 feet. I was thinking about Dean. I knew he'd be worried. We should have made it to the DIA by now. We should have sent a rescue party by now. Soon Nico pointed to a big road sign. We had to pick whether to take the I-25 to the I-225 or go right and take the tollway. The tollway is more direct, I said, but it will probably be more used because other people would also choose the most direct route. On the other hand, the I-225 runs through more densely populated areas, I think because it gets closer to Denver. Nico thought for a minute, without saying anything, he took the tollway. Oh, Dean, it's so bad. It's so bad what happened. We took the toll road and we were making good time. We reached Parker, so that means we'd gone about halfway to the DIA. I saw something standing in the road. The light from the headlights bounced off it and it was a gleaming shape, like a ghost. There, I said, something white. I wiped at the plexiglass windshield and squinted out. I, I saw it was a girl. She was wearing a white coat, somehow it was not too dirty, and her face was uncovered. Stop! It's a girl! I shouted. She had long blonde hair, that white blonde like Max has. She, ha she held up her hands for us to stop. Her hands were bare. Nico slowed but didn't stop. He honked the horn. Nico, you have to stop! No! He shouted. Too risky! The girl opened her mouth and I could see she was screaming for us to stop, though I couldn't hear her. Stop! Sahalia shouted. The little kids joined in too. Nico slammed on the brakes. I don't like it, he heard himself say. I opened the door mechanism. Get in, I shouted to the girl. And then I saw them coming. The darkness started moving, is what it looked like. And then shapes came out of it and I saw they were boys. Teenage boys in camouflage. Their faces had been painted, or maybe they'd used mud. Three of them rushed at me and I pulled the door shut. They banged on it. Nico tried to back up, but they'd gotten something behind the bus. I don't know what, but he kept trying to reverse and crashing into something over and over. It was two motorcycles. Two of them rolled a dead motor motorcycle in front of the bus. We were trapped. One of them, I guess the leader, came in front of the bus and tapped the butt of a rifle against the plexiglass. He was wearing a scarf tied around his mouth and a black beret on his head. His eyes were rimmed with red and they looked wild. Who are they? Sahalia screamed. Cadets, Nico answered. Air Force cadets. He's O, he's O, I shouted. Nico laid on the horn. Get out of the way, Nico shouted and immediately started coughing. Get out of the way, I yelled. Screw you, the leader shouted. We want the bus. Tell them they can come with us, Nico said to me. He couldn't yell loud, and loud enough for them to hear through the mask. You guys can come, I shouted. We're going to the airport. If they throw down their guns, Nico added. If you throw down your guns! The leader jammed the butt of his rifle into the glass. They're killing people at the DIA. Don't you idiots know that? He shouted. They're sorting them into groups and killing people who saw it go down. They don't want any witnesses. I looked at Nico. Sahalia was behind us. He's crazy, she said. He's paranoid. Three other cadets had come to stand around their leader. He might be crazy, I pointed out, but what about the rest of them? They were all wearing camouflage fatigues. None of them wore gas masks. I guess the rest of them were either type A, B or B. Where's the girl? I wondered aloud. Then there was a bang and the little kids were screaming. I turned to see a cadet climbing in one of the back windows. He'd hacked it down with some kind of hatchet. One of them started kicking in the door. Nico got up and grabbed his backpack, which I know had the gun in it. But before he could get the gun out, the cadet got the door open and they were inside. Jesus, the leader shouted. The bus is stocked. He let out a crazy, happy whoop and picked Sahalia up and kissed her on the mouth. She squirmed away as Nico shouted, Get your hands off her! The leader smacked Nico across the face. Nico's mask came off a little bit and the guy grabbed it, holding off it off his face. Stop it! I screamed. He'll die! I kicked him and he let the mask go and turned on me. He grabbed me by my jacket. I Tell you what, you tell me everything I want to know and I'll keep the driver, I'll let the driver keep his little gas mask. How's that? 
Nico was gasping through the ear mask. Sahalia was on the floor in the aisle. She started pulling Josie out of the aisle, away from us. The other cadets were coming up the steps now. They were high-fiving each other, happy about their conquest. First off, what's with him? The leader asked, nodding at Josie. Him? I stalled. My mind hiccuped. He thought Josie was a boy. Okay, I'd go with that. He's typo. We had to... And that guy? He cut me off, nodding towards Brayden. Brayden, he got shot, I said. We're taking him to the airport to find a doctor. Jesus Christ, he yelled. I saw his cadets jump. Didn't you hear what I said? They're killing people at the airport. They're out to get us all. Brayden here's dead. He's as good as dead. Was that true? I didn't think so. This guy was clearly crazy. Sahalia started to sob. I do not know why she did that. It drew the leader's notice. Oh, you have a little something for Brayden. Don't cry, baby. Peyton will watch out for you. He put his hand down and touched her on the face. I'll take care of you, honey. You can be my girl. Nico tried to get forward so he could, I don't know, jump on the guy, but the cadets near the door stopped him. How'd your bus not get skunked? Peyton demanded. Skunked? He rolled his eyes. The white fuzz that grows on rubber eats the tires. Where'd you get the bus? We were locked inside a store with the bus, I said. We sealed in the air so it wasn't exposed. So you left a big sealed-in store filled with food and water to get Braden here to Denver? Yeah, I shrugged. And how long you been on the road? Well, what do you mean? How many hours have you been on the road? After 24 hours, the tires start to skunk. We left the store around 10 a.m. yesterday. Sweet, they still got some play left in them. Last question, he said, turning back to me. Where's the store? I caught Nico's eye and he shook his head just a bit. The King Soppers, I lied. Which one? In Castle Rock. Which one? The one? The one? You're a liar, he shouted. Then he ripped me across the face. I don't think it would have cut me if I hadn't, he hadn't been wearing a ring. It felt like fire across my face and then there was blood on my gloves and running down my neck. Batiste shouted it out. We came from the Greenway and Monument, he yelled. The Greenway and Monument, Colorado. Peyton laughed. Now that, I believe. He smiled at Batiste. All right, boys, we're going to Monument. Braden will die, Sahalia screamed. He's going to die if we don't get to Denver. Peyton pulled her to him. You give me a kiss and I'll get him there, honey. Her eyes got really big and scared. She leaned up on her tiptoes and kissed his filthy cheek. I was afraid he'd grab her and kiss her again or worse. Instead, he put his hand up to his cheek. Nice, Peyton said. You're nothing but a little thing, aren't you? He put his finger under her chin and made her look up at him. Sahalia is some kind of magnet for jerks, I think. For you, little girl, I'm going to save Brayden. Peyton shouted, we're going to save this boy. Sir, yes, sir, the cadet shouted. We're going to take him to Denver. Then he grabbed me by the jacket and shoved me into the aisle. Now get out, you all get out. We're going to take Brayden to Denver now. What? The little kids were crying. Get out, Peyton shouted. He pushed Sahalia toward the door. Even you, my little sweetheart. You've got to go so I can get the job done. It happened so fast. He was kicking us out of the bus and we didn't have a moment to think or anything. Hey, we have to get Braden to Denver and we can achieve our mission with a bunch of pukey crying... S we can't achieve our mission with a bunch of pukey crying sissies loading us down. I didn't even have my backpack, but I looked back and saw Max grabbing all the backpacks he could find. Ulysses started grabbing stuff too. Peyton reached over and snatched the backpacks away from Max. Max let out a cry and the leader picked him up and threw him down the aisle towards the door. This stuff is ours now, you get me? All this bus and everything on it is ours, so you better get off, otherwise you'll be ours too. A short, greasy-looking cadet grabbed the water bottles away from Ulysses and kicked him down the stairs. Sahalia was trying to get back to Braden now and one of the cadets was holding her back. He sort of wrestled her out the door down the steps. Braden, Braden, she sobbed. Nico was still in the driver's seat. It seemed like he didn't know what way to go or what to do. Hey, driver boy, Peyton called to Nico, nudging Rosie, Josie's hip with his boot. You better come and get this comatose kid if you want him. I wonder whether Peyton would have let Nico take Josie if he known she, he'd known she was a girl. But with all the layers, who could tell? Nico got up and went down the aisle towards Josie. Peyton leaned down and sniffed Braden. Fourth man, Braden smells ripe. We better get to Denver right away to get him to a hospital. Nico picked up Josie and half carried, half dragged her off the bus. I noticed he had his backpack on. I noticed it because I was right behind him. Brayden! Sahalia was screaming from outside. I love you! 
That made the cadets laugh. I love you, Brayden, they mimicked. Come on, boys, we've got to get this jack up to Denver, Peyton yelled. The cadet dragged a crushed motorcycle out from behind the bus. To Denver, they were cheering. To Denver! But the way they said it, mocking and overexcited, excited, you could tell they weren't really going to Denver. You can't just take our bus, Batiste shrieked at two of the cadets. Oh, yeah, said the really tall, gangly one. He pointed his gun at Batiste. Just watch. Now they were all on board and we were all off, besides Braden. The girl in the white coat slipped around the corner of the bus. She looked like she was afraid. She stepped up onto the first step of the bus. Hey, I called to her. She looked at me, her big blue eyes open, round and wide. You don't have to go with them. You can come with us, I said. I thought maybe she was like their captive or their slave or something. She took a long look and then she stuck her middle finger up at me. Chapter 7. Dean I slept hard and hallelujah I slept until I woke up of my own accord. Yes, I got to sleep in. What woke me up was just the growl of my own stomach. I went out into the living room and found the three kids building Lego walls while Astrid read on the couch. Breakfast had been eaten. Cereal was soy milk by the looks of it. Caroline was still in her PJs but looked better. Luna was even up and about. Seeing me, Luna rose and came over to give my hand a hopeful sniff. Good morning, Astrid said. I made you coffee. Dean, when will they be here? Chloe complained. I'm sick of waiting already. All we do is wait and wait and wait. She was interrupted by a bang. I turned to Astrid. What on earth? She said blankly. Bang, bang. It was coming from the front gate. Chloe, you stay here and take care of Caroline and Henry, I ordered. She closed her mouth with a snap. I grabbed a headlamp and, and Astrid took a flashlight and together we ran toward the front gate winding our way through the dark, cold store. Luna ran beside us, barking her head off. Bang! Bang! Someone was shooting at the gate. Stand back, I told Astrid, throwing my arm out to block her. She stopped close behind me, her body pressed against mine, and even in that moment of tension and fear, I was aware of it. We moved around to the side, out of the way of the gate. What do you want? I yelled towards the closest bullet hole. Luna was barking herself hoarse. Bang! Another shot tore a tiny hole through the gate. Luna, shut up! Astrid grabbed Luna's collar and held her back. Who are you and what do you want? I hollered. Stop! Stop shooting! I heard from outside. I had to strain to hear the voice. Then there was a thud and a rattle on the gate, as if someone or something had been smashed against it. Hey, kid! came the voice. It's me, Scott Fisher. Why are you shooting our store? We already gave you food! I yelled. That's just it, man. This guy here... And again came the thudding sound and a dull rattle from beyond the plywood. This guy here found me and he said I had to show him where I got the stuff. And if you don't give us more, he's going to kill me. I looked at Astrid, illuminated from below by her flashlight. Shoot, I said. We have to help him, Astrid pleaded. I know, I said. Scott Fisher gave a cry of pain. Okay, I shouted, okay. He says you have to open the store. We'll throw down food, I shouted. It's going to kill me if you don't open the store. Look, we can't open the store, but we'll throw down lots of food and water, okay? There was a sound of an argument, but we couldn't hear the words. I could hear the tone, though, and Scott's voice went higher and higher, fighting, begging. Another rattle on the great, great gate, and now his voice was desperate. Watch out, kid, he's going to... Another bang, bang, and then it was quiet, and it seemed clear that Scott Fisher was dead. Going to what? Astrid said in a quiet voice. I'm going to look for weapons, I told her. You stay here and hit the air horn if they try anything. Thank God we'd found those stupid headlamps. I knew I looked like an idiot, but as I ran through the store looking for weapons, I was glad I was wearing my flashlight on my head and had my arms free. If only Jake hadn't taken the one gun. We'd had two from the outsiders. And when he left, Nico had taken one. That was good. I wanted Nico to have one. But Jake had taken the other gun and then walked out on us. I begrudged him that gun. I thought of potato guns. I didn't know how to make them, and I was pretty sure they took a long time to make. There was some way to use aerosol cans to make blow torches, but I didn't know how to do it. What could I do? I guess I could go and get a bunch of knives from the kitchen aisles and throw them at the intruders. So lame. I wanted to wring my own neck for being so lame. Dean? came Chloe's voice. She must have heard me moving around in the aisles. What's happening out there? It's nothing, I shouted. You're doing a good job, Chloe. Just keep the twins there. Just wait for us. Everything's okay. 
We're bored. Just be bored then, I yelled. She was such a brat. I raced towards home improvement. Why had I spent time building us a room? I should have been making weapons. I needed my brother, who could make anything out of anything. Or Nico, who just naturally thought in terms of survival. I paced through the store aisle after aisle. Home improvement seemed like the best option. I came to the barbecues in the lighter fluid. My best idea was to squirt it on them and light them on fire. Stupid, I know, but I was in a panic. Back at the gate, Astrid was poking putty into the holes in the gate. You okay? I asked as I ran towards her. I carried a case of lighter fluid and a couple of those long neck fireplace lighters. They're gone, she said quietly, at least for now. You sure? I haven't heard a sound. Okay, good, good, I said. Were you going to barbecue them to death? Astrid asked, her hands on her hips. I was mad for a second, then I saw her eyes twinkle in the glow from my headlamp, and I started to laugh. Her laughter joined me, and it totally got away from us, until I had tears coming down my face. Shoot, I said, you're funny. Sometimes, Astrid answered. I got some wood putty, want to help me plug up these bullet holes? Sure, I answered. As we worked, I told her about an idea. I saw some chainsaws in home improvement. They're mostly kerosene, but there are a couple of battery-powered ones. I knew a little about chainsaws because I'd helped my uncle clear some land down near Placerville during the summer. Uncle Dave had two chainsaws, one gas and one battery. The battery one was a lot less powerful than the gas one, but it cut scrub oak okay. I shuddered with the thought of what it would do as a weapon against a person. Can't you use the lighter fluid? Astrid nodded towards my can of Kingsford. I grabbed a bottle. No, it's not kerosene, it's aliphatic petroleum solvent, whatever that is. Well, how are you gonna use how are you gonna charge the batteries? she asked. Maybe a car battery? I suggested. Yeah, that could work, she said. We were a good team. I was glad she had decided to, we had decided to work on being friends. She was holding up her end of the bargain and I was trying my best not to worship her. Where have you been? Do I have to do everything around here? Chloe chided when we returned from hooking up the chainsaws. They were playing hospital and Caroline, appropriately, appropriately enough, was the patient. Bad guys were trying to get in, Astrid told her. Bad guys? Henry repeated. He and Caroline looked up at us with an identical expression of fear in their two sets of eyes. Every once in a while, taking care of the twins, I'd feel a sort of lurch in my heart. They were so, um, beautiful. I know that's a dorky word to use, but they were. Their smallness and warmth, their wide-open smiles and abundance of freckles. It made my chest ache to think of how Mrs. McKinley, if she were still alive, must be missing them. Whether it was in her honour or in her memory, I had to keep them safe. How bad? Chloe asked. What? I said. On a scale of one to ten, how bad were the bad guys? I don't know, I told her. Bad enough. They couldn't get through the gate, though, Astrid said. She ruffled Henry's hair. Too bad for them. Astrid had a pretty good approach with the kids. Josie would have withheld the truth, probably, and spun some story. But they seemed happier just knowing the facts. Bad guys had tried to get in and couldn't. Caroline, it's time for a sip of ginger ale, Chloe directed. Caroline sipped dutifully. Okay, now Henry's going to take your pulse, Chloe said. Henry knelt by the futon and pressed his fingers somewhere in the vicinity of Caroline's elbow. Henry and Caroline looked at each other with big, serious eyes. It's better, he announced. 109 and 48 pressure. Excellent, Chloe nodded. Now the patient must eat more crackers. Henry fed his twin crackers a bite at a time. Chloe looked on, content and the very model of efficiency. Dean, I had an idea, Astrid said. I saw a brass fire pit on home improvement. I thought maybe I'd drag it over to the kitchen. I don't want to light it in here in case it gets too smoky, but I thought it might be kind of cheery to have a fire at night. Yeah, sounds cool. Exhaling, I ran a hand through my hair. So far, the morning had been pretty intense. I'm going to eat some breakfast, I told Astrid, and then I'm going to do a security check on the store. Good idea, she answered. Chapter 8, Alex. Nico had Josie in his arms. Her head lolled back, bobbing loose. Sahalia was sobbing, clinging to Ulysses, who was also crying. Me and the others were just standing there, gaping. It was hard to grasp. Our bus had been taken and we were out in the dark. We have to get it back, Sahalia shrieked. We have to attack them and get Brayden and kick them out. Guys, Max tried to butt in. How? Nico said from behind his ear mask. They have guns. There are five of them. Guys, Max yelled. 
We need to find somewhere safe until Josie wakes up, and then we'll figure out what to do. They'll be too far gone by then, so Halia protested. Guys! Max shouted. What? Nico yelled. I know where we can stay, he said, and then he pointed over to a clump of dead trees. There was a military floodlight near there, and in the glow you could make out a sign. Meadow Flowers Mobile Home Community. What is it? Batiste asked. It's a trailer park, Max said loudly through his mask. My auntie Jean lives there. Nico was right. We had no choice. We couldn't catch up to the bus on foot, and if we somehow did, there was no way we could kick the cadets off it. We had to go and seek shelter. It didn't keep Sahalia from crying and cursing the whole way. Nico had to carry Josie. It did not look as easy as it looks in the movies. He had to stop and rest a lot, and I was afraid his mask would come off. The little kids were all clustered around me, and I did not blame them. It was really scary. Sometimes a fuse would blow at our house. I used to be scared to go in the basement to flip the switches. I was scared of the basement because it was so dark and there were things in there in the darkness. You couldn't see them, but you could feel them. Flattened boxes, Dad's old, old tools, the lawnmower. None of it scary with the lights on. But the thought of all of it just lurking there made me scared. I would always be afraid that a murderer was hiding in the shadows, waiting to grab me, even though I knew that that was totally illogical. Walking down the road was like going into the dark basement, except there really could be a murderer lurking in the shadows. There was likely a murderer lurking in the shadows. It was statistically probable. Maybe you're wondering if we didn't have flashlights. We did, but Nico wouldn't let us use them. He said he was afraid we might call attention to ourselves, and call an O-monster, I assume. So we just had to see by the light from the mil military lights, which was not very much. We came to the meadow flowers entrance and walked through the trailer graveyard. There was blood on one of the trailers and a lot of clothes out on the ground in between two others. All of them trampled into the mud. Purposely trampled, it seemed to me. There were empty food cans and bottles from all kinds of drinks scattered everywhere. Some of the trailers had furniture pulled halfway out the windows and doors. Like people had tried to take their easy chairs or mattresses and then given up. A dead lady sat in a doorway in a house dress stuck to her in a house dress stuck to her body with blood. Ulysses started to cry again and Max took his hand. We're almost there, Max shouted through the mask, encouraging his friend. There were lights on in a trailer we passed. I could hear an old man singing a country song my grandma used to sing called Let's Give Them Something to Talk About by Bonnie Raitt. We didn't knock. Nico was having a hard time with Josie, so I carried his backpack. I should have thought of it before but I and offered, but I was too scared, I guess. Finally, Max pointed to a baby blue trailer on the fringe of the others. It was dark, but there wasn't any blood on the windows, and they weren't broken. I could see plastic over the windows inside. Another good sign. Max stepped up on the step and knocked on the door. Auntie Jean! he yelled. Auntie Jean! At first, nothing, and then he pounded on the door. Auntie Jean, it's me! Right at the corner of the window, a the drape pulled away, and a lady's hairline and an eye and eyebrow appeared. Go away! I don't got nothing! she yelled. Let us in! he shouted. What do you want? she yelled. It's me! It's me, Max! Max Skolnick, Jimmy's kid! The door opened. I am not exaggerating. A cloud of cigarette smoke came out. Maxie? she said, putting her face through the crack. At that moment, I did not notice much about her beyond the fact that she had a gold tooth. It's me, Auntie Jean, Max said. She threw open the door. And we got inside somewhere somewhere safe, thank God. This Jean lady cried for a real long time, hugging Max to her and sobbing into his white blonde hair until it looked kind of tan. I'm pretty sure she was drunk. It was crowded in there and smoky. She told us that she'd been smoking non-stop because the smoke kills the compounds. I didn't believe her, but she was right. Cautiously, we took off our protective gear and everyone was okay. This was very good information prime information to have. There were cigarettes everywhere, flowing out of ashtrays and jars and stacked up on paper plates and old issues of Star News magazine. There were also a bunch of smelly candles, scented candles I mean, and all the scents together with the smoke made it pretty dense in there. Flowers and vanilla and Cambry and dive bar drunks. I helped Nico and Jean get Josie up onto the bed in the back. After we got Josie on the bed, Nico just slumped down to the floor and I saw he was crying. It's okay, I said to him. There's nothing you could have done. I blew it, he said. We had a shot. I know we could have made it, but I blew it. He just turned his face to the side of the bed and cried. I patted his back. 
I didn't know what to do. I'm not good when people cry. I do not know what to say. I just stand there flapping my arms like a stupid magpie. I went into the front room where I saw that Sahalia was sitting in the banquette, facing away from the others and smoking a cigarette. I should have been shocked. I shouldn't have been shocked, but I sort of was. She rolled her eyes at me. Max's auntie Jean was now helping the kids out of their layers. She was tugging a sweatshirt off Ulysses. Lord, you got some chunk on you, don't you, doll? She asked Ulysses. He smiled tentatively at her. Are you sure it's a good idea to take off their layers? I asked her. The poison's in the cloth, she answered me, her gold tooth glinting. You all got to take them off so I can air the poison out. The tasty Max and Ulysses looked helpless. They were each standing in their underwear, fidgeting. Sahalia, as you can imagine, was having nothing to do with this. She took a long drag on her cigarette and shrugged at me. Jean was wearing skinny jeans, high-heeled slippers, and one of those ladies' Christmas sweaters, with the tall shoulders and the sparkly designs. It had a snowman on it with a pointy orange nose and some fake gems for buttons on his snow stomach. She took all the clothes she'd taken off Max, Batiste, and Ulysses, and put them in a garbage bag. Come on, she said to me, snapping her fingers. Get down to your undies, pal, so I can do it all at once. No way, not in front of you two, I indicated her and Sahalia. For Lord's sake, honey, I'm trying to keep us all safe here. She put her hands on her hips, a cigarette stuck in the corner of her mouth. I'm fine, I insisted. Jean went over to a coat rack on the wall and handed me a warm white robe that said Marriott on it. Go on in the toilet and put this on and throw out your clothes, she said. You can keep your undies on. I should have left my long johns on. Sahalia snorted when I came back in the room wearing nothing but my tidy whiteies under the robe. I wanted to punch her right in the cigarette. Jean had pulled her straggly hair back and was something different from when we'd come in just a few minutes ago. At first I couldn't place it. Then she took her cigarette out of her mouth and I realised what it was. There was now a lipstick stain on her cigarette. But in all the butts on the table near the door and all around the place there wasn't lipstick. She had put on lipstick at some point since we'd gotten there, maybe 15 minutes before. She had put on lipstick for a bunch of kids. Isn't that weird? I thought it was weird and I do not know why I remembered it, but I did. All right now, I'll show you, she said. This is how you clean your clo clothes nowadays. She took a huge drag off of her cigarette and blew it into the bag with our clothes in it. You want to help? She said to Sahalia. I'll help, Max offered. Are you drunk? Jean said. Jimmy would kill me if I let his kids smoke. And then Jean started crying again, and Sahalia had to do all the smoke blowing by herself. Chapter 9. Dean. First I checked on the chainsaws. I detached the chainsaw battery from the car battery and inserted it into the chainsaw. I pushed the button and vroom, the thing came to life. I shut it off quickly, didn't want to make Astrid worry or the kids come running. But I was relieved. Now we had weapons of some kind. Not so good against bullets, but close up they'd be horrific. Hopefully just holding one would be a threat enough to make any intruders leave us be. My next stop was the storeroom. I wanted to make sure the hatch was properly locked, and I also knew I should do something about the bodies. I brought two chainsaws with me so I could bring them over to the house when I was done in the storeroom. I decided I should teach Astrid how to use one, just in case. I was right, the bodies were beginning to smell. I needed to seal them off somehow. My first idea was to put them in giant plastic bins, but none of the bins were big enough, not by a long shot. So then I turned to plastic sheeting, but we'd used all the plastic drop cloth when we'd sealed the gates. I headed for the shower curtains. We had used some of those, but maybe not all. And that's how Mr. Appleton and Robbie came to be shrouded in floral nylon shower curtains. Maybe it sounds funny, but it wasn't funny to me. It was a nightmare to roll them up in those curtains. Mr. Appleton's body was heavy and rank and stiff, as if someone siphoned out his blood and replaced it with cement. Robbie was grisly with the blood, but the sheet we'd thrown on him was stuck to his face, so at least I didn't have to look at him. I got them wrapped up and laid them side by side on the floor. The next step was to drag them over to the wall. Then I thought I might get some boxes or maybe decorative rocks or something and cover the bodies so the kids wouldn't see them if they came into the storeroom. And I needed to wipe down. I smelled like something dead. Dead men to be specific. And that's when I felt the hit. There was a sound like a big thunk, but more than the sound, I felt the impact. Impact. The floor shook. I grabbed a chainsaw and rushed back into the store. Dean! I heard Astrid shout. I'm back here! I yelled. Thunk! The impact came again. I was close to it. 
I scanned around with my headlamp trying to find what could be making that noise. Thunk! And now a heavy clunking noise, the sound of cinder blocks caving in. I scanned the wall, running from aisle to aisle. The sound was coming from the corner of the store near the storeroom, near the dump. Someone's trying to break through! I saw Astrid's light come dragging towards me. Then I saw the attack site. The cement bricks were caving in at the floor. Then they moved, and we all saw the reason. Two metal prongs had crashed through the wall. It's a tractor or something, I yelled. The prongs retracted. They're trying to get in, Astrid screamed. Behind Astrid, Chloe and the twins appeared with Luna at their heels, barking her head off. Go back to the train, I yelled at them. You always say that, Chloe shouted back. More bricks crashed inside. There was opening an opening of maybe two feet across now, down at knee height. Get back, I shouted. I pulled the chain starter on my chainsaw and it roared to life. Dean, Astrid yelled. Dean, we need our masks. The tractor came back, puncturing higher this time. The hole was getting bigger. Blocks rolled inward towards us. Astrid pulled the kids away from the site. Get to the train. Lock yourselves in or you're dead, she hollered, dragging them back and back. Come on, Chloe, Henry shouted, and the twins hauled Chloe off to the train. Astrid took off towards the front gate, going for masks, maybe. I didn't care. I could already feel my blood rising. Who was trying to get in? I would kill him. Gonna wreck our store? I would kill him. More cement blocks fell. I saw the front of the machine. It wasn't a tractor. It was a pallet lifter. The chainsaw roared and vibrated, shaking my arm. I loved that chainsaw. It felt like a natural extension of my body. And so, I stepped over the rubble, on top of it, and ducked through into the black world. I was out and I was about to kill someone, and I had never felt so alive or so full of blood or so bone-deep fantastic in all my life. Luna raced out alongside me, barking her head off. Dean, I heard Astrid call, her voice muffled. Dean, careful! But I didn't need to be careful. No, kind and considerate were all in my mind. I was in my body now, and the body had a strength that the puny mind could never wield. I pushed Dean, the whole personality, right out of my being. I was the chainsaw now. Kids, if you don't like gruesome scenes, you should fast forward this bit. I vaulted over the prongs of the loader as it came forward again. The driver saw me, but he was too slow. Way too slow. He pulled out a pistol and aimed it at me, but I was moving so fast now. Whirring, moving, slicing. I pulled him out of the loader and cut him right through. Neck, up, neck arm, torso, done. Then through again, shearing through torso, belly, hip, done. Then my hands were wet and the chainsaw was lodged in the man's pelvis. The motor whined, growing louder and louder. It wanted more. I pulled and pulled, and meanwhile, meanwhile I heard talking. Voices. A boy and a girl. Something like, Jake? Jake? I came back. You came back? I saw the guy attacking, but I was too late. Help me, Dean Zoe. And I thought, two to kill, two to kill. But my chainsaw was still stuck and whining. It was jammed with bone and had bit into the metal and I couldn't get it out. I could kill them with my hands, though. I roared and turned, and then I was felled. Jake, he had hit me with something. A cement block. And as I fell face down on the ground, there was blood in my mouth and it tasted good. Now I can kill Jake, I thought. But then there was a rope and he was tying me up. I strained against the ropes as hard as I could, bucking and fighting. The rope cut into my wrists and ankles. I bellowed in outrage, my face pressed onto the bloody asphalt. He started dragging me back into the store, my arms and legs bound behind me. Face down on the pavement, I got dragged. I would kill him. Jake was a dead man. Then white sneakered feet came close to my face and a gas mask came into view. It was Astrid. Don't bite me, she shouted through her mask. Ah! I shouted, and she forced an ear mask over my face and duct taped, it, duct taped it to my head. Jake, Jake, Jake! My blood bit the name of the kid that I would kill. Chapter 10, Alex. I've been thinking about it, and I think it would have been better for all of us if Braden had died on the bus. Then Sahalia wouldn't be so mad at Nico, and Nico wouldn't be so mad at himself. And Josie... Well, when Josie wakes up, I think she will be very upset. But if Brayden had just died, then we could have all felt better, or s felt bad, or sad, or whatever, but just get on with it. Nico napped next to Josie for a while, and then Jean made him wake up, and give her his clothes to purify them. He put on some men's clothes she had lying around. 
Everyone was hungry, so we had some trail mix and some cookies and some water. Jean took some and wolfed it down. The speed at which she ate the cookies let me know she wasn't about to share any food with us. It let me know that she didn't have much, or any. We went through Nico's backpack to take stock of what we had. Of course, he had packed well, so there was a little of everything. Two 40-ounce bottles of water, one and a half bags of trail mix, five packs of beef jerky, four packages of tuna, eight protein bars, bandages, band-aids and antibiotic cream, two bottles of Benadryl, assorted foil packs of pills in a plastic bag, one gun, half a box of ammunition, two flashlights, one long rope, two boxes of matches, each in its own plastic bag, three pairs of wool socks, this seemed like too much to me but I didn't say anything, one rain poncho, three candles. The water was definitely a problem, we would need more, and the food situation was not great either. Max wanted to eat a protein bar but Nico said absolutely not. I felt stupid that I hadn't grabbed a bag. Nico didn't say anything, but there was a moment when he said, Is this all we have, out of everything on the bus? And I felt bad. He had packed it so well and now a bunch of mean thugs had it all to themselves. Sahalia cried herself to sleep. She was curled up on one of the banquettes. Max, Batiste and Ulysses went and lay down on the bed around Josie. They arranged themselves like puzzle pieces, fitting themselves next to her body as closely as they could. We were safe, but I think they wanted some extra feeling of comfort. I took the other banquette, which was not comfortable at all, and used my very smoky sweatshirt as a pillow. I woke up to the sound of arguing. I'd missed the start of the argument. I had also missed the moment when Josie woke up, but it must have been quite a shock for her to find us not on the bus, and to learn that she was typo, and how Nico had drugged her, and then about the cadets and Braden. It was Braden she seemed stuck on. How could you just leave him? she demanded. Josie, I had a choice. Him or you? Nico protested. He's wounded. It all happened so fast, I didn't have time to do anything. They were standing near the door. Just one candle was lit on the formica counter, peach scented, I think, and it gave them a glowing quality. I could just make out their shining silhouettes. After everything you said about not wanting him to die, you left him on a bus with a bunch of strangers? She asked softly. I had no choice. There had to have been another way, Nico, Josie said. I could hear the tears in her voice. Josie, Josie, please, Nico pleaded. Their voices became hushed. I craned my neck up to see. He had her by the arms and had drawn her close to him so their foreheads were touching. I promise I feel just as bad as you do, he said. And then they kissed. Okay, that was new information. I guess Nico and Josie were boyfriend and girlfriend now. We have to go after them, Josie said. It's impossible. We have to go on. We have to try and make it to Denver. But Nico! Suddenly he was close to shouting. You're the one who said we could do this. You said if anyone could get us to Denver, it would be me. And I meant it. Well, now we've got to try, Nico said. His voice was flat and gruff in the way it gets when he's serious. We've got maybe two days worth of food and water if we really can serve, and we're about 25 miles away. Jean told me she heard there is an army camp about 10 miles down the road. If we get there, they can help us. What about the others? Josie asked. The cadets are headed right for them. Dean is smart, Nico answered. That store is a fortress. He won't let anyone in, and who knows if the cadets will even make it there. Maybe they'll get ambushed. There was hopeful malice in his voice. I had been thinking along the same lines. So we're driving then, Josie said. Can we find a car, do you think? Nico turned away from Josie and started repacking his backpack. Is that the plan? No, Nico said. I mean, the white stuff. It eats the tyres. That's why we didn't see any other cars moving along the road. So unless we can find one that's been inside this whole time? We're gonna walk? Josie asked. Her voice was hard and incredulous. Don't worry, Josie. I can carry you. What? I'm going to sedate you and carry you, or look for a wheelbarrow. Josie started to laugh. That's absurd, Nico. I can do it. I can do whatever it takes to get you to safety, Josie, he promised. She shushed him, and then she kissed him, pressing her body to his. If you're walking, I'm walking, she said. I'll take the, take the gas mask down or something. I'll be very, very careful. No, Josie, he protested. It's not safe. She must have stopped him talking by kissing him on the mouth. Josie whispered something to him, I think it was, I love you, because then Nico said, I love you too. I tried to get back to sleep. I didn't want to be a peeping Tom or anything, and 
and they were making out Josie called Ulysses from the bedroom Josie and then something in Spanish maybe he was having a nightmare she moved to go comfort Ulysses we're gonna get these kids to safety Nico she said and I could hear the smile in her voice we can do it you and me what about me I thought to myself and then I realized maybe she was talking about me maybe she thought I was just one of the kids Chapter 11, Dean After a good long while, the rage receded. I became aware that I was lying face down on the lino. I tried to move and the pain in my shoulders and quads was unbearable. I realised I was hogtied. Jake had hogtied me. I was groggy and for a moment I just lay there. Blood from my mouth was sticking my cheek to the inside of the gas mask. Slowly I used my tongue to loosen the bond. I felt around in my mouth for broken teeth. There were definitely a couple of teeth missing. My glasses were gone, broken no doubt. Awesome. I breathed in, taking a good long draw of the moist, clammy air filtered into the mask. Jake and Astrid came close, arguing. I'm telling you, I was walking around the store. I was going to try to the intercom in the back when I heard the noise. Why were you coming back anyway? Astrid asked, her voice muffled through her own gear, ear mask. Because I missed you. Why do you think... I felt terrible I left the way I did. I really did. He probably just came back because he ran out of drugs, Astrid hissed. That's not true. They were lifting and fitting the cement blocks back into place. Let's just fix the wall, Astrid said through her mask. Where is everybody? Jake asked. Oh, Jake, Astrid said, her voice sounding sad. They left. Nico started up the bus and they're all trying to make it to Denver. No kidding, Jake said. I didn't think he had the huevos to pull off something like that. He was trying to be jocular, but he sounded exhausted and spent. I moved my head, shifting my body onto one of my shoulders. The stupid face mask that duct taped to me was cutting into my jaw. I groaned. The grogginess was wearing off. Listening to Astrid and Jake was bringing me back, mostly because I felt like I was spying them. Spying on them. I didn't want to do that again. You mean it's just you and Dean? Jake asked. I'm awake, I said. They didn't seem to hear. It's not just me and Dean. Chloe and the twins are here, Astrid told him. Well, where are they now? I told them to lock themselves in the train, Astrid answered. I'm awake, I repeated loud, louder. Can you untie me? Hey, killer, Jake drawled, bending into my field of vision. How are you feeling? He nudged me with his foot. My shoulders were on fire. Untie me, I demanded. You gonna behave like a human being? You all done being a monster? I'm fine, I grumbled. Where did you come from anyway? I felt bad about the way I left, so I was coming back. And then I saw that guy attacking the store. Then I saw you attack the guy. Man, that was something. He looked a little green remembering it. But through the face mask, colours are off. I might have been wrong. Lucky I came along when I did, he drawled. You could have hurt my girl. I turned my face away from him, pressing it into the cold lino of the greenway floor. He was right. That felt like the worst thing about everything that had just happened. I would have hurt her. He tossed Astrid his pocket knife. Here, he said, why don't you cut the book of free while I go and get the kids out of the train? I craned my neck to watch him go, but he didn't head for the train. He headed for the pharmacy. After she sawed through the ropes, Astrid and I worked on repairing the wall. She and Jake had put most of the bricks back in place. We were using plumbing cork to fill between them and to fill the holes where the rocks had crumbled. We couldn't, it wouldn't keep anyone out, that was for sure, but it would seal the air out. Astrid told me that Jake had dragged the body away and then moved the pallet loader so it was blocked so that it blocked most of the hole and it wasn't too visible from the outside. She told me the pallet loader had its tires stripped off and was just rolling on its wheel rims. That seemed weird. Was there some kind of rubber shortage outside? Jake had also removed the battery from the machine so no one else would be able to use it against us. I nodded. That was good, whatever. We would have to guard the hole to make sure someone else didn't just push right through. It was a mess. We can board it up, Astrid said as if she was reading my mind. We'll put up plywood. We can make it safe again. I could hardly look at her. I knew she wanted to talk about Jake's return, but I felt wrung out and miserable. I had killed a man. And I'd nearly hurt Astrid. As for Jake, well, I was not happy that he was back. Not at all. It was stupid to even think about my chances with Astrid, but with him back, I knew they were down to nil. And did I mention I killed a man? Then Astrid made a weird choking sound. I looked at her and she was grabbing her mask. Are you okay? I asked. I can't breathe, she gasped. 
Her eyes were wide and crazed. She was in some kind of panic attack. She was clawing at her mask, gasping for air. I dragged her away from the wall, back into the store, into the home improvement aisles. Look, it's okay here, I said, gambling that the air would be clean enough, that we'd sealed the leak enough. I ripped my mask off, the tape tearing at my hair and skin. The air's okay. Astrid took off her mask and took in a long, ragged breath. I'm sorry, she wheezed. I just started to think about Jake and I felt trapped and then I couldn't breathe. It's okay, I said. And before I'd even opened them for her, Astrid was in my arms. Oh, Dean, she said and looked up at me. I feel bad for him, but he's not the guy for me. And God help me, I kissed her. Okay, kids, I'm going to skip the next part. Let's just say Dean and, and Astrid's relationship goes to a new level. I'm pretty sure Jake saw us. In any case, by the time we came to our senses again, by the time we got our clothes back on and our masks back on, and by the time I was thinking straight again, he was high. He'd let the kids out of the train and they were a castic that he was back. They were cooking s'mores over the camp cook stove. I could see the remains of a hot dog and baked bean meal. Luna sat at his feet, wagging her tail blissfully. We took our masks off as we approached them. A weird kind of lie, I guess, that we'd had our masks on the whole time. Hey, you two, Jake slurred his back to us. I was so hungry, we just cooked up some franks and beans. I hope you don't mind. The wall's back up, Astrid said, bustling off her sweatshirt and tossing the ear mask onto the empty futon couch. We need to reinforce it, but it's pretty solid. Look at my gal, she can do anything, Jake said to the kids. I missed her so much. I missed you all, of course, but especially my gal, Astrid. We missed you too, Uncle Jake, Caroline chirped. She and Henry were toasting marshmallows over the blue butane flame. Look, Henry said, I got mine perfect golden. That's how our mum likes it, just golden with no burnt parts, Caroline added. Takes patience, though, Henry commented, and a steady hand. I just like mine burned, Chloe said, putting her marshmallow into the centre of the flame. Look, I'm the Statue of Liberty. She held her blazing marshmallow up high. Careful, Astrid snapped, you'll burn someone. That's always the risk, Jake said. He looked up at us and his head lolled off to the side and he caught it and grinned even wider. I'd seen him do that before. He was high. The air's fine here, no symptoms, right kiddos? Chloe's feeling just fine, we must be far enough away from the hole. Come on, Jake slurred, we've got to stay puffs aplenty. I'm going to change clothes, Astrid said, I feel dirty. Jake watched her leave, a glassy look in his eyes. Sit down, Dean, Jake called, stay a while. He was definitely high on the same stuff he'd been taking before. Jake turned to the twins. Henry, do you know what they say about assumptions? What? Henry asked, bright as a penny. Chloe, do you know? No, what? She said. Assumptions make an ass out of you and me. They all thought that was hilarious. Dean knows what I'm talking about, don't you, Dean? He elbowed me in the ribs. Jake, what are you talking about? Here I am, assuming everything will be the way I left it. But of course, how could it be? I've been gone for what, two days? Two frickin' days? Is frickin' the F word? Henry asked. Yep, Jake said, it sure is. Told you, he said to his sister. Caroline yawned again. I think I'd better check your bandage, Caroline, I said, and it might be time for your medication. Oh, don't go, Jake said. He tried to clap his hand on my shoulder and missed somehow, toppling over. The kids thought this was the funniest thing ever. Oh, Uncle Jake, Caroline squeaked. You're so funny. Uncle Jake, I asked. Why is he an uncle all of a sudden? We decided, Henry said. Astrid's the mum and you're the dad and Jake's the ankle. Oh boy, why were kids so perceptive all the time? To tell the truth, I like their idea of the perfect Greenway family, but their timing sucked. Yeah, Jake laughed, a tinge of desperation thrown in there. They got it, they got it right. I mean, really, that's about the long and short of it. He got to his feet. He was moving slow like an old man, a drunk old man. Kids, he said, you have to excuse me, but I'm so tired I feel like I could cry blood. And he staggered back into the berths. Just like they would have in the store. We all woke up hungry and Nico doled out one third of a can of tuna for each of us and one quarter of a powder bar, power bar. Jean was moved to generosity by this and gave everyone a can of fresca. Warm fresca and dry tuna. Yum. Sahalia let it slip that she'd had some gum but wouldn't share it. Not one little stick. 
Fortunately, Jean let me rub some toothpaste around on my gum so I wouldn't have breath like I ate a donkey's butt all day. I would have thought that we would all want to try and stay there in the trailer for as long as possible, but surprisingly enough, we do not. I'm writing this last piece, then we're going. I think it was because it was so small in there. We were all on top of one another. And when the little kids heard that the army guys are only 10 miles away, everyone got excited. We can make 10 miles, no problem, Max crowed. We can do 10 miles in our sleep. Yes, sir, that's my baby. No, sir, don't mean maybe, Ulysses sang in his Mexican accent. Where he learned that, I could not say. I don't know, Batiste said. Ten miles is a lot. It's going to be hard work, but I know we can make it, Josie said, patting Batiste on the arm. She was always very encouraging to the little kids. I think that even if we were marching off a cliff, she'd keep everyone peppy and excited. But Max is staying, Jean asserted. Baby, you're home now and I'll keep you real safe here with me. You're staying, right, pal? Max thought about it for maybe three seconds. No offence, Auntie Jean. But these guys is just as much my family as you is. But I'm a grown-up, Max. And maybe your dad will come here looking for me. Max screwed up his face like he really didn't think so. Jean got down on the floor and looked him right in the eye. This is your best chance, hun. You're staying. Auntie Jean, you ever meet my dog Lucky? Max said. I had this dog named Lucky and he was a mutt what we found out back of the Safeway. And he had, one miss he had a missing eye. And my dad's dad says... Oh, they did right to put him out with the trash, son. That dog's no good. But I swore and swore I'd take good care of him if they left him, let me keep him. And my mum said, over my dead body. And then my dad said, maybe it's not such a bad idea. And that's around when my dad moved out. Anyway, I took Lucky to the free animal clinic. And they sprayed him and gave him some worm drops for him. And also cut off his man parts. He cleaned up real good, but my mum still hated him. I don't know why. Honey, all I'm saying is that I want you here with me. Jean tried to interrupt. I guess she'd never heard Max tell a story. He just continued right on. So then, for Christmas, my mum goes and gets me a brand new puppy from the actual pet store. A chow, real fluffy with a bow. bow. And she goes, you can keep this new one, baby, but you gotta let me take old Lucky to the shelter. And I said, no way. Oh, and she yelled and she put up a fuss and she said, how do you not want this darling fluffy and instead you want that mangy stinking so-and-so? I just think you'll be safer here, Jean tried again. And then she went and gave that child dog to her sister Raylene and played it off like she'd always meant it to be for her anyway. Well, then on the last day of vacation, do you know what happened? Max asked us all. I was walking in the lot behind the sewage treatment plant and Lucky starts barking its head off and what do I see? I'm about to step on a rattlesnake. It's just there, sleeping over the slops tank where the ground is nice and hot and it's shaking its tail and hissing at me. And then Lucky rushes forward and bites the thing on the neck and kills it dead. He looked at us as if his story completely answered Jean's concerns. After a few moments she said, Honey, I don't understand that story. What does it mean? It means stick with the dog you know, Auntie Jean, Max told her. Stick with the dog you know. Nico wants us all to drink lots of water. He's made the point that the kids who need to keep their masks on will not be able to drink out there. I keep forgetting that, but he's right. If they lift their masks, they'll get hit with they'll get a hit of the compounds and then they could die. Or Josie could turn an, into an O monster and kill us all. Jean had the idea that we should take some cigarettes with us. Then we could get into a car and Sahalia and I could fill it with smoke and the others could take off their masks to drink. Sounds like a lot of work just to get a drink, but it's what we all have to do. We do not really need to be concerned with the harmful effects of cigarette smoke at this point. Nico gave Jean Jean gave Nico three packs, which is a pretty expensive gift. All the while she was crying and made Nico promise if we get to help to send someone back for her. We left the trailer park and followed the road. Nico had to walk in this, had us walk in this order. Him, then Max and Ulysses holding hands, then Sahalia, then me and Batiste holding hands, and then Josie at the rear. It bothered me that I had to hold hands with Batiste, but I got used to it, and he was really scared, so it was a good idea. Only Nico was allowed to have a flashlight. He was right, because when the little kids had them, they'd shine them all around and that was worse than not seeing around, because every so often they'd find a body and then they'd scream and cry. Nico kept his light on the ground, a few feet in front of us, steady and measured. It was hard to walk in the dark, but it was sort of okay, because we had, it was like we had blinders on. We couldn't see to the left or right just where the flashlight was. We didn't walk on the road. Nico felt we might be attacked. Instead, we walked on the side, about 20 feet off, parallel to the road. 
On the road there were lots of cars and lots of bodies. Things were moulding over, the white fuzz growing in drifts over cars and bodies. It made me think of Mr Culleton in Earth Studies in our block on composting. He said that in a compost pile things return to their most dense, nutritive form. If the sun ever comes back, maybe this will be the best farmland ever. I know that's a stretch. That's the only nice thing I can think to say about all the slime and mould. Anyway, we walked. And Batiste got blisters, which he told me, and he got thirsty, which he told me, and he got hungry, which he told me. And I said, I'm sorry about that, Batiste, every time, and it actually seemed to help him. Then I'd give his hand a squeeze, and then that also seemed to help him. It was a hard, hard walk. Finally, Nico led us back up to the road. He started flashing the light into cars. I nudged Batiste. I bet we're going to stop for a water break. He smiled at me and squeezed my hand. Nico flashed the light in a few cars, but there were bodies in them. He made us stand back from him and wouldn't let us look in. I didn't mind standing back. I didn't need to see any more bodies. None of the little kids did either. On some cars, Nico tried the doors but couldn't get them open. Then suddenly he ducked down and motioned for us all to do the same. He cut the light. light. A motorcycle was coming. It darted and veered between the cars. The light seemed really bright and it made me realise that my eyes had become somewhat adjusted to the darkness. It came closer and closer. It was a biker guy wearing goggles. He had a long beard and a leather jacket and everything. And riding on the back was a little old man. He had a snow hat on and a jacket that seemed way too big for him. They went right by and didn't see us at all. Maybe it's his father, said Batiste. Most likely, I agreed, or just someone the biker found and wanted to save. He must have had the bike stored away somewhere airtight, like our bus. I wondered how long the tyres on our bus had lasted. I hoped that they had rotted to shreds. Nico found a car. It was a silver Nissan Murano. He waved us over and we hurried and got into the car. Max and Ulysses flopped down in the way, in the way back. I sat in the back seat with Sahalia. Batiste and Nico and Josie were up front. Like a family car trip, except not at all. Sahalia and I got the cigarettes out and started puffing away. Do you know how awful cigarettes are? The smoke gets in your chest and makes you cough. You do get a nice feeling in your brain, a kind of openness, but that's it. I was blowing smoke towards the back and Sahalia towards the front. Is smoking a sin? Batiste asked Nico. No, Nico answered. It's unhealthy, but it's not a sin. Well, then I guess I'll smoke too. Okay, Nico shrugged. No fear, Max and Ulysses protested. Sahalia lit a cigarette for Batiste and passed it to him. Don't inhale too much, she warned, or you'll puke. I held my cigarette between my pointer finger and my thumb, but Batiste held his between his first two fingers like a V. He looked like a little Frenchman. Sahalia watched him for a second and then snorted with laughter. Batiste pricked up one eyebrow and said, What? Somehow that was just too funny. Him all grimy, wearing God knows how many layers, but with a clean, round face and his hat perched on his head and the cigarette. We all started laughing. The laughing was that boiling over kind, the kind that brings you to tears and makes you gasp for air. When we stopped laughing, I saw that Max had taken his mask off. He seemed fine. He was laughing his head off. Nico took off his mask and then Josie. It does seem to work, Nico said, the smoke. We'll all get lung cancer, Josie said grimly. This too seemed really funny and we all started laughing again. Josie rolled her eyes and gulped down some water. Nico handed out the protein bars. Thank you God for this food, amen, Batiste said quickly before digging into his bar. Nico, is it true what that cadet guy said? Max asked. About what? About them killing people at the airport, he murmured. No chance, Nico said. He was either lying or paranoid. What's this? Josie asked concerned. Nico explained what Peyton had told us. If I could get my hands on that guy, she growled. She cracked her neck. Ulysses, watching her, started to whimper. His eyes looked dilated, not at all right. No, nope, she said. I'm starting to feel it. The smoke isn't working. And then she put her mask back on. Max coughed and let out a cry. The mitten he'd coughed into was bloody. Put your mask back on, Nico shouted. Ulysses screamed, backing away, backing away from Max. You too, Ulysses, help him, Nico commanded Sahalia and me. Sahalia and I tried to reach back and help Ulysses get his mask on, but Ulysses battered at Sahalia's hands and crying out in Spanish. Finally, I grabbed him by the back of the collar and Sahalia got the mask on. Max hugged his friend, pinning his arms down. It's okay, it's okay, Ulysses, it's just us, it's just us. Ulysses calmed down after a few minutes. So much for the smoky car idea. 
but at least we'd gotten some water and had a snack. Let's move out, Nico said. Chapter 13, Dean. I dreamed of Astrid all night. We hadn't spoken much after Jake went to bed. Every time I looked at her, my face got painfully hot, so I tried not to look her way too often. She seemed to be giving me some space too. But after the kids went to bed, I had a thought. Hey, I'm worried about the gun, I said. What gun? she asked. Jake has the other gun, the one we got from Robbie and Mr Appleton. I'm scared he might get really depressed and, and use it. Oh God, Astrid said, realising my meaning. You're worried that he has a gun and might kill himself? I don't know him as well as you do, obviously, but those drugs, drugs are powerful. Well, he doesn't have the gun, she told me. She was studying her feet. How do you know? He told me. Well, I exhaled, suddenly frustrated with him. Where is it? What did he do with it? Astrid let out a short, hard laugh. He gave it to some girl. She edged away from me. She still wouldn't look me in the eye. Wake up, she said. She was in my berth. I shook my head awake. I wasn't dreaming it. She was really there. What is it? I asked. My heart was hammering wildly. Was it the wall? Jesus, we should have been watching the wall. I just want to talk to you, she told me. She had a pen-sized flashlight pointed at the floor. I saw she was wearing pink pyjamas and had bare feet. She was shivering and she looked so beautiful, I thought that my heart might stop. We went to the kitchen to talk. I grabbed a fleece for myself and a sweater, and for her a sweater that I'd worn a few times. We sat down at a two-top in the pizza shack. I saw the brass fire pit Astrid had set up. It was shiny new and filled with a couple of logs. Somehow the sight made me sad. It looked so shiny and hopeful. Astrid, I feel so bad about what happened, I blurted out. It was wrong, and if I'd been stronger, it never would have happened. No, she said with a wry set to her mouth. I knew you'd be feeling your guilty. Look, we didn't mean to do what we did, but it's not bad or wrong. It's not even our fault. Jake and I had an open kind of thing, no commitment. We're free to do whatever we want. Oh, I said, and I sat back in my chair. Okay. Astrid, you know how I feel about you. I'm crazy about you. Dean, no, not now. Why? I'm good for you. You said it yourself. I'm a good guy. I would never leave you like Jake did. Dean, listen to me. If Jake confronts us, I'm going to say it was a huge mistake. I'm going to say it was the compounds. But why? Look, maybe I have a little crush on you right now, but Jake's the father of my baby and he's in a really bad shape. He needs me. You said it yourself. He's depressed. He could be suicidally depressed. He probably needs the promise of, of being with me if he's going to make it through this disaster. That doesn't make sense. It does to me, she said. It's not fair, I protested, probably sounding like a dumb kid. She laughed bitterly. What about any of this is fair, Dean? Then she squeezed, squeezed my hand. I'm sorry. And she rose to walk away. I sat back in my chair. That's it? End of discussion? For now, she said. It seemed outrageously unfair. When he was the king of the hill, the most popular, the most handsome, Jake got to be with Astrid. And now he was going to get, get to be with her because he was a pathetic mess when she liked me. Me. I stood up and headed back towards the berths. No way was he going to win this one. I didn't know how it would play out, but I wasn't letting Jake get Astrid without a fight. And you know what? It felt good to have something to fight for, besides, besides the old garden variety survival. I couldn't get back to sleep, so I made everyone a big breakfast. A little crush on me. Astrid had a little crush on me. Was it wrong to feel a heart spike of happiness in the middle of the apocalypse? I carried the food to the kitchen and lit the fire in Astrid's fire pit. The kids were excited when they saw the fire pit. It was something new. They'd stopped asking us about being rescued, I'd noticed. They stopped even thinking about being rescued. We all just stayed in the moment. Jake came over, walking like he had a hangover. He took a big bowl of oatmeal and a big mug of cof coffee with creamer. Astrid came, dressed in my blue sweater and a pair of jeans. Was it some kind of message to me, the sweater? Was I supposed to be placated by it? The kids got their oatmeal. Cinnamon spice, Chloe complained. Are we out of peaches and cream flavour? If you can find it, you can make it for yourself, I told her. Nah, I'll just eat this, she sighed. Yeah, you're welcome, I said. Jake, I have to tell you something, Astrid announced. She sat down opposite him at the table. Jake took the fireplace poker and jabbed at the flame burning in the centre of the brass fire pit. Save it. I already know, he scowled. I saw. Saw what? Caroline asked. It's not about that, she said. It was That was just an accident. We're O's. It just happened. What just happened? Caroline asked again. 
I had good news for you, Astrid barreled on. Good news. Drake set down his pl plastic spoon and looked up at her. We getting rescued? He asked bitterly. I'm pregnant, Astrid said. Jake just stared at her. What? He asked. I'm going to have your baby, Jake. She pulled up her sweater, my sweater, and showed him her belly. Jake saw the rise now. Once you saw it, you couldn't miss it. How far? He croaked. Four months, she said. You're going to have a baby? Caroline gasped. Astrid nodded. A smile played on her lips. The kids squealed. They jumped up, so delighted, so happy. They hugged her and danced around. Astrid laughed and let them have their moment, but her eyes kept flickering towards Jake. Jake roared with happiness and jumped up. He swept Astrid into a big hug and kissed her. I'd had enough. I walked away. What's wrong with Dean? I heard Henry ask. He'll be okay, Astrid said loud enough for me to hear. Sure, sure I'll be okay. The girl I loved, who loved me back, or at least liked me back, was going to get back together with her manipulative, depressed, drug-addicted boyfriend. Also, the world as we knew it had ended, and add that to the fact that I'd killed a man. That one kept creeping up on me. I went to look at the hole. I wanted to take down some shelf boarding from the accessories department and put it up over the hole as a layer of extra protection. And that's when I heard the noise. Something was rattling in the storeroom. Hello? I called into the dark space. I shined a flashlight around. There was the shattered operations centre with the useless panels that had once controlled our power, air and water. There were t the two lifeless bodies near the wall in their matching floral shrouds. Boxes of merchandise spilled their guts here and there. Empty pallets in a messy stack against the gate next to the intercom. Everything was in place. The rattle came again and it wasn't coming from the loading bay gate. It was coming from the hatch. I stormed back to the kitchen. They were all gathered there lingering over the breakfast that I had cooked for them. Jake, I shouted. Did you leave the ladder hanging down from the roof? What? Jake asked, looking befuddled. Did you leave the ladder hanging down from the roof when you left us three, goes, get three days ago? No, he protested. Alex hauled it up after me. I'm not stupid and neither, neither is your brother. Well, there's someone up on the roof now and they want in. Who are you? Jake hollered through the hatch. He had insisted Astrid take the kids to the train. She had agreed, much to my surprise. The hatch was padlocked, thank God. I'd checked it the day before. We're just some kids, the voice said. It did sound like a kid. Please let us in, it's scary out here. Now that sounded a little like sarcasm. Jake and I exchanged a look. We stood on the metal staircase, crammed together under the hatch. How'd you get up there? Jake hollered. What? The voice said. We can't hear you. Whoever he was, it sounded almost like he was laughing. Jake and I shared an uneasy look. How'd the heck they get up there? Jake murmured. We need to talk to you. We have a message from your other friends. What other friends? I shouted. I'd put a mask on, of course, in case we needed to, in case we decided to open the hatch. What are the friends? Jake repeated. The ones with the bus. I stared at Jake. You have to let us in, the voice demanded. We have Braden with us. Jake and I scrambled to open the lock. Not for a second did we think it might be a trick. Braden! Jake screamed. How did you find Braden? We pushed open the hatch and three guys were standing in the beam of our flashlight. They had guns. They wore dark uniforms, dirty and ragged. Their faces were uncovered. One of them wore a beret and had some gold cords going under his arm. He was the leader, there was no question. Hi, he said, cheerful as could be. Thank you so much for letting us in. And then he kicked Jake in the chest. Chapter 14, Alex. We set out again. Max had to be carried. He had blisters on his feet that had burst. Nico had given him his extra socks, but apparently Max's feet still hurt too much for him to walk. I was sick of all the crying and whining. I had blisters too. Mine had burst too. Every little step was like knives stabbing into my heels, and I was all hot in the stupid layers. It occurred to me that I could just take them off, but then the little kids would whine even worse that it wasn't fair that I didn't have to wear layers. I had already paid the consequences of my blood type. I would never be able to have kids. Was that enough? I was in a bad mood. We trudged along. Maybe a mile or an hour? Maybe? Maybe a mile an hour? I was in a very bad mood. It was less dark than usual and I realised maybe it was midday. It was almost as light as the night with a full moon. Or maybe it was that our eyes had adjusted to the light. But I could actually see, sort of. Everything was greenish, but I could see. And then we stopped. Nico crouched down, letting Max slide off his back. 
He motioned for us all to get down, and as Sahalia and Ulysses crouched down, I saw why we were stopping. Up on the road, under one of the floodlights, there was a soldier. He was wearing lots of gear, including a machine gun. Some equipment hung off his belt. Two bright orange ear masks and some vial-shaped things in a holster. Flares, maybe. Nico was whispering for us to stay put, but Sahalia lurched to her feet and started running towards him. Help us! Sahalia cried. Hey, mister! Hey, please help us! Our friend is on a bus! Wait, Nico hissed, but Ulysses and Max started running towards him too. Wait! The soldier turned, and at first I thought he was smiling at us. He took off a hat that he was wearing and threw it aside, his arms open wide. Then he brought up his gun and was running then too. He fired it at Sahalia. It just went click, 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 and then he roared. The soldier was O, oh, definitely O. Oh. Sahalia skidded to a stop. She tried to back up, but Ulysses crashed into her. Then they were all scrambling backwards, away from the soldier. He swung his gun free from his shoulder and started coming at Sahalia with it like it was an axe. He'd said something and it came out a dry grunt. He lifted up his gun and brought it down again, said the word again. Nico grabbed Sahalia and hauled her back. Josie grabbed Max and Ulysses and I ran. I ran by Batiste, who was frozen in horror, and grabbed his arm and shouted, RUN! The O soldier was right on us. He kept grunting his word, and sometimes he would laugh this horrible low guffaw that sounded like a cry of pain, but was his laugh all the same. And then I understood what the word was. He was saying, kids. All I had in my mind was to get away. I'm embarrassed I didn't take more care of the younger ones, but all I did was run. So my mind wasn't working in a logical way, but my theory looking back is that the, o, the O's who had been out the whole time since the compound leak were worn out. All that rage had drained them. The O soldier, soldier was still vicious and strong and deranged, but he looked thin and thirsty. The bloodlust made them stupid, is my idea, too angry to eat or drink properly. The O soldier stumbled on in the underbush as he traced us, chased us. His slowness was good for us because we started to get some distance on him. Tall, thin shapes rose up through the dark here in front of us, and I realised we were in an aspen grove. The skinny trunk stood white, and it was very still between them. Now we dodged away from him like rabbits, going in different directions, and he got very frustrated. Josie grabbed me and pulled me with her behind a stand of the trees. The little kids headed for Nico, who started boasting, boosting Ulysses up into the thin branches of one of the trees. Good idea, I thought. The O soldier headed towards Max. Sahalia, who was behind a different tree, shouted, Over here, dummy! and waved. The soldier lurched towards her. Max! Nico hissed, calling him. Nico was now helping Batiste into another tree. Max moved towards Nico, but his spook got stuck in a root. I think the boot pulled halfway off, and Max screamed. I realised his blisters were worse than I thought. I could see blood on his socks, and the O soldier headed back towards him. Max couldn't get his foot free. Hey! Josie yelled, waving. You stupid jerk! Here! He threw a stick at him, but the soldier didn't turn. A kid! A kid! A kid! The soldier repeated, his voice deranged and happy and disgusting. He was descending on Max's cowering form. Max screamed. And then Josie stepped in front of me, and as she moved towards the soldier, she took off her mask. Josie pulled it off and threw it to the side like it was nothing, and she ran, breathing in big, loud breaths. She launched into the air and landed on the soldier's back. The sound that she made as she flew at him was horrible. It was loud and jagged and throaty. It was awful, also joyful, liberated, pure rage. It seemed like something she'd wanted to say for a long time. Josie landed on his back and I think she sunk her teeth into the back of his neck. He made a motion to swipe her off and the motion toppled him to the side. Max finally pushed back away from them, scooting back through the dead leaves and dirt. The soldier threw Josie off him. She rolled back in the leaves and hid her head on a tree. You gonna kill us? She growled as she rose, her voice thick with hatred. A bunch of kids? They circled each other. Meanwhile, Nico dug in his backpack for the gun. Sahalia had come round the back of my stand of trees. She grabbed me to her. She clung to me, hugging me. Josie launched through the air, almost flying. She tackled the soldier. He took a swing at her, but she but missed. I can't get a shot! I can't get a shot! Nico shouted, trying to aim the gun at the O soldier. His hands were shaking. Then Josie was on top of him, sitting with her legs over his shoulders. She started punching the sol sol soldier on either side of his head in alternation. She was just wailing on him. Big guy? He was kicking then more weakly. You kill kids? 
She lifted his head and banged it down on a rock, I think, because there was an awful sound. And you're tough? Again, she banged his head down. Again, the sick thud. Again. Josie grabbed the soldier by the hair and screamed in his face. You kill kids, huh? Only he was already dead. His legs weren't moving and his face was splattered with darkness. His head actually seemed not to be the right shape anymore. You gonna kill us? Josie asked him again, and another thud. He's dead, Nico said. She banged his head again. Josie, he's dead, Nico shouted. He dropped the gun and lurched forward towards her. No, she shrieked, backing up. Get back! It's okay, Jojo, you're going to be okay, Nico tried to reassure her. He had his hands up as if they were to show he meant no harm. Nico scrambled to the dead soldier's body. He pushed him over, scrambling to get one of the high-tech ear masks on his belt. Put a mask on, Nico pleaded through his own. Let me get a mask for you, you'll feel better. Sahalia darted forward to try and help Nico get the mask. No, Josie sobbed, backing up. Batiste stepped forward. Josie, you saved us, it's over now. Ah, Josie cried. She wiped her bloody hands over her face. And then she turned and ran. Josie, Nico cried, don't go. Josie, we all screamed, but she ran away. I think she might have killed us if she'd stayed. Nico started sobbing. There's no other word for it. He just crumpled down over the legs of the dead soldier and sobbed. I didn't know what to do. I sat down. <clears throat> Sahalia went over and kind of rubbed Nico's back. Batiste kept screaming for Josie. Max was whimpering. He was in pain. Ulysses climbed down from the tree and went and got Max's boot from where it had got stuck under the root. And for a long while, that's all the movement there was. Just fat Ulysses trying to help his friend get his boot on. And then Nico sat up. He was very methodically stripping the gum belt off the soldier's corpse. He took high tech, he took the high-tech ear orange master number one from the belt, and then he took his own mask off and quickly switched, putting the better one on. We could now hear his breathing. He was still having those leftover sobs, the sporadic ones. We could hear because the high-tech mast had some kind of speaker built in. Nico took the other mask over to Max. He moved slowly but purposefully, like someone chronically depressed or very, very tired. Hold your breath, he told Max. I couldn't get over how well I could hear his voice, like better than I could if he didn't have a mask on. He ripped Max's mask off and put the high-tech orange mask number two in its place. We could hear Max draw in a deep, deep breath. It sounded wet in there. Max spluttered, then he said, I'm sorry, Nico. I thought to myself that we all were, and Nico said, I know. Nico stripped the soldier bare. He left him with his underwear, but even took his socks. The socks he put on Max, and then he put the soldier's boots on Max, and then he put the soldier's coat on Max. To their credit, neither Batiste or Ulysses said a word about fear. Nico pulled the, put the soldier's pants on over his own layers. I guess that he thought that they would be too long for Max. The vials were flares and I got to wear the belt. I'm hungry, Max said, his voice sounding small somehow. Is there any food? We have to get somewhere safe, Nico said. Then we'll eat and drink. Like where? moaned Sahalia. Another car? Nico said. There was something so bleak about his voice, even Sahalia knew not to press him further. He walked and we followed. Josie was following us. I was sure of it. There were sounds coming from behind us. Snaps in the bush. Twigs breaking. I was pretty sure. Then I saw Nico perk up after he heard the sounds too. Nico, did you notice that Josie, even when that enra was in that enraged O oh monster state, was able to form full sentences? I asked him quietly. I didn't notice, but yes, I think you're right. Dean couldn't speak that way when he attacked me, I continued. Maybe Josie's... Nico held up his hand to shush me, and he whispered, Let's not talk about her. We might scare her away. Then his pace picked up some. What Nico did next was a total surprise to me. He told us a story. You know, we're probably going to not have to walk much further. Why not? said Max in a thick voice. Mrs. Woolley. What do you mean? asked Sahalia. She's out looking for us, of course. Sahalia snorted. Really? Batiste asked. Of course, Nico said. She's got a new bus, I bet. Or maybe a minivan. She's out driving around looking for us. What's in the bus? Ulysses wants to know, Max said. Well, it's a really nice bus, so of course it has a kitchen stocked with food and drinks. What kind of food and drinks? Batiste asked. Um, Nico thought for a moment. I had the sense that his imagination couldn't keep up with, quite keep up with his own narrative. 
There's a tray of sandwiches I joined in with plastic wrap over it, like from a deli. And there's a potato salad and macaroni salad and pickles. And to drink there's pop, but also fresh squeezed orange juice. You know what's cool about the bus, Sahalia added. I thought she'd say nothing. But instead she said, it's got beds in it. I'm serious. These white beds with clean sheets and fluffy duvets. What are duvets? Max asked. They're these comforters stuffed with feathers and they're incredibly soft and warm, like sleeping under a cloud. Well, where's she going to take us? Max asked. I'll tell you where, Nico said. We walked for a moment as Nico thought. To Alaska, he said. We're just going to drive straight there. It was good to talk about something real. I know that sounds stupid because, of course, that's what we were, what we were talking about was total fantasy. But one month ago, what would have been a, been more far-fetched? A ride in a van stocked with sandwiches and beds, or a series of environmental catastrophes that would leave us in a dark world, filled with corpses and monsters. We talked about Mrs Woolley for a good long while. No one bothered us or attacked us. Every once in a while I caught the sound of someone trailing us, and I was happy, because I knew it was Josie, and Nico did too. Chapter 15. Dean. The cadets jumped down onto us, forcing us backwards down the staircase. They screamed war cries and were laughing with the raw exhilaration true bullies feel. Punching and kicking and pushing, they wailed on us as they pushed us down to the bottom of the stairs. I fell to the cement floor, bashing my head and my shoulder. Something tore inside my shoulder, it screamed in protest, and I had trouble gathering up my body again. I felt jumbled and frozen with the pain of it. I just lay back on the floor. Zaremba, go get Anna and the others, the lead cadet ordered. Tell them the sweet little sissies opened right up for us. One of the two cadets started back up the stairs. I saw Jake sit up, shaking his head to clear, clear it, trying to recover. Mickey, Jake said. Mickey Zaremba? The figure on the stairs stopped and turned. Who are you? he asked. He had short brown hair and a huge bruise on one side of his face. Jake Simonson, remember me? I was a prospective at the academy. I stayed with Jamie. Holy crap, Peyton, Mickey Zaremba said, coming back down the stairs. I know this kid. Jake, he stayed with Jamie Delegado. The kid can, this kid can hold his liquor. Mickey wanted to cross to Jake. You could feel it, but he waited for a nod from Peyton. Peyton did not nod. He swaggered over to Jake himself. So we know you, huh, kid? Lucky for you. Pretty darn lucky. Peyton gave Jake a, Jake a hand and pulled him to his feet. He pulled Jake real close, right up to his face. Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Bradley Peyton, Squadron Commander of the Fightin' Fourth, he said. And you are? Jake Simonson, sir, Jake answered, finding his footing. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Jake, Peyton said, his face just inches away from Jake's. Then he released his grip and Jake backed away a step and looked at the floor. I hope you got a lot of food, kid, because we're starving. Yeah, totally. Whatever we got is yours. Jake grinned, the model of jocularity. We have more than we can use. I shot him a look. Jake smiled right at me, and I read total terror behind that smile. There were five of them, including Peyton, and a little girl. The girl was somehow wearing a white jacket that wasn't filthy. She looked strange and withdrawn. This is Anna. She's my niece, and she's our little decoy, our lucky charm. Peyton ruffled her hair. Like a rabbit's foot. Only... Don't touch her. Nobody touches her. It's one of our rules. That's because she's my cousin. The girl looked away, far away. She smoothed her hair and down with utter detachment. None of them had an ear mask or was wearing any layers, so that meant they were all either A, B, paranoia, or B, sexual dysfunction. They had guns, shotguns and handguns. Each one of them seemed to be packing something. As they clattered down the staircase, my mind was racing a million miles an hour. Could I somehow go out and warn Astrid? Would she know to stay hidden and not come hollering to see what had happened? Most of all, how were we going to get them to leave? It was obvious that Peyton was paranoid. He seemed crazy and very aggressive. After he had helped Jake up, Peyton saw some wrapped up bodies in the corner and went right over to them. I cursed myself for not covering them up. Peyton poked them with the barrel of his shotgun, with his handgun. Naughty, naughty, he said, wagging a finger at Jake. Somebody's been killing grown-ups. We're going to have to keep an eye on you and your friend too. What's your name, honey? He said. He rode, strode over to look in my ear mask. Dean. Oh, I get it. Dean, like the dean of a school. P 
Payton was at least 20, maybe 21 or 22, broadly built. His crew cut was brown and there were little red drops of dried blood on his face from a splatter that was not his own. His eyes were the colour of yellow mud. Hey Dino, he tapped on my ear mask with his gun. What are you, O or A or AB or what? Is that your handiwork over there? He nodded towards the bodies in the corner. I'm A, I lied. Well then we better get you out of here before you start to peel, son. He winked at me. He turned to Jake. The last of his group were filing down the stairs. Well, let's eat, Peyton boomed. Come on, Dean and Jake Simonson, you two lead the way. One of the other cadets hauled me up and I cried out from the pain in my shoulder. Oh, now don't whine. I hate whiners, Peyton tut tutted. Wait, I croaked as the cadet man handled me towards the two main doors. What? Peyton shouted. What did you say? Be cool, Dean, Jake said, anxiety heavy in his falsely light tone. The hatch, I said, talking loudly so that I could be heard through my mask. We need to close the hatch. Peyton looked at me as if he was seeing me for the first time. Brilliant. Yes, of course we need to close the hatch. I like this kid. I like these kids, Zaremba. Nice work. And he threw his arm around me. My shoulder screamed, but I kept my mouth shut. Jake and I walked them towards the food aisles and away from the house. My every agonised step was a prayer for Astrid to get the kids and hide, hide, hide. The cadets whooped and started tearing into cookies and chips and crackers. Jake and I thought we were forgotten for a moment. I took my mask off and rubbed at my face. My whole body was covered in cold sweat. It was stupid, but I was almost glad my glasses were lost and broken somewhere outside near the pallet loader. Maybe I looked cooler and tougher without them. Instinct told me coolness and toughness had suddenly become survival qualities. A cadet came and stood watch over us. Dude, Jake said to the cadet, aren't you hungry? The cadet clearly wanted to be eating, but had his orders. Shut up, he growled. We're not going anywhere, Jake said, as friendly as could be. I said, shut up before I have to put an end to your chatter with the end of my sw sm Smith and Wesson, said the kid. He was shorter than us, with camouflage grease paint all over his face and through his hair. He also had a lame, scraggly moustache. I nicknamed him, nicknamed him Greasy. We watched them gorge themselves, eating and drinking and spraying one another with soda. If we hadn't seen the kids by, by now, there was a very good chance that Astrid had got them all into hiding, wasn't there? Jake and I glanced at each other from time to time, and that seemed to be what he was saying to me. It was definitely what I was trying to tell him. And how the hell had Astrid managed to keep Luna quiet? I remember something, reading something about mothers in World War II who had had to smother their own babies to keep them from crying and revealing the position of the family to the Gestapo. I felt sick. How was she keeping Luna quiet? You guys made out like bandits, Peyton said, coming to stand with us. He held open a box of Che Mix. He offered it to us. You want some? No, thank you, I said. No, thank you. No, thank you, sir. That's more like it. Listen, you don't know anything about us, so let me inform you. I'm a second-class cadet. The rest of these losers are doolies. Fourth year, like freshmen. That means I outrank them. That means they do whatever I say and then no one gets hurt. He threw his arm around me and I saw stars. I whimpered a bit and Jake shook, shot a look at me. You know what I realised, Jake said. I never, how, I never asked how you guys met Brayden. Peyton looked blank for a moment and he laughed. Brayden! Oh lord, he wants to know how we met Brayden. He shouted to the gorging cadets. We met him on the bus. I felt my insides turn to ice. What bus? Jake asked, bluffing. We ambushed the bus, Jake. Don't play stupid. We ambushed the bus and that's how we found out about this place. One of the little squirt squirts told us exactly where to come. Oh my god, he was about to say that he killed my brother. What would I do? What would I do if he said that? We told them not to leave, Jake lied. He was sweating. Jake was shaking and sweating. Stupid idiots. Why would they ever leave here? Peyton agreed. He munched another handful of Che. Oh, I know. They wanted to save Braden. Well, yeah, he died. Yeah? Jake asked. To tell you the truth, we killed him. He kept moaning and moaning. Oh, Lord, he's driving me crazy. So I had to ask one of my guys to smother him. I couldn't take the moaning any more. I hate moaners. Peyton looked sidelong at, side at Jake, assessing his reaction indirectly. Jake nodded. Me too. He looked grey. They never would have made it to hospital anyway, Peyton continued. Nope, we kicked those losers off that bus. I believe they were going to try and make it to Denver on foot, idiots. My brother, Nico, Josie and the rest were now on foot, or had been whenever this ambush had happened. I felt sick to my stomach. 
But you know what? I made a mistake when I let them go, Peyton said. He looked around the food aisles and saw that Anna was drifting away towards the nuts and trail mix out of earshot. I should have kept that sweet little girlie on the bus. Peyton elbowed Jake. I bet you miss her, right? He said to Jake. He was talking about Josie or Sahalia, so he hadn't killed them and he hadn't messed with them. That was good. Okay, okay, Astrid had to have the kids hiding by now. She was very good at hiding away. They had to be safe from this sicko. I was starting to think he wasn't crazy from the compounds. He was just crazy on his own. Uh, M Mr. Payton, sir, I stammered. Cadet L Lieutenant Colonel, he corrected me. What? I've been meaning to ask. How would you guys get up on the roof? Old-fashioned grappling hook, Dean. That Zaremba can climb anything. And then he found a ladder and threw it down for us. Real thoughtful of you to leave it up there, he said, clapping me on the shoulder. I should have kept my mouth shut. I almost fainted from the pain. All right, Billies, Peyton said, addressing the group. Spread out and give me a report. I want full recon on this here green Greenway Superstore. Exits, entrances, assets, liabilities, weapons. Peyton winked at us. I hated those mean, malicious winks. Also, be on the lookout for any alcohol. Daddy sure could use a drink. The cadets cheered. Hey, Jake said, as if suddenly remembering something. Where are my manners? Do you guys want to get high? Chapter 16, Alex. Eventually we saw a development. Most of the houses were dark, but there were lights in a few. Can we try one? Sahalia asked. Maybe they have food. Nico didn't answer. He started to skirt the complex. Nico, please, can we rest? Max said, starting to cry. Please. Okay, okay, let's try that one, Nico whispered to us, pointing at a unit on the side of the development. Two windows had lights on the first floor. The light was diffused, like it was coming through sheets of clear plastic. Stay close, Nico said. So that so we all came up close and behind him. And that was actually a mistake, because it looked like a stretch of lawn ahead of us, a manicured lawn with some leaves and debris scattered around, but it wasn't. I was right behind Nico, and suddenly he fell forward, and the ground was jerked away from under my feet, and I fell backwards, and I was falling back on Sahalia, who was behind me, and then we hit the bottom. We were in a pit, and above me I saw Ulysses holding onto some roots or rocks or something. But he couldn't hold on for very long, and he tumbled down and landed with us at the bottom. It was a trap. Dean, we fell into a pit trap. They had laid a tarp on the top part of the foundation for a new house. Because it was dark, we didn't see the tarp, and now we were in a pit. The walls were cut by an excavator. They had that pressed-in texture with rocks and roots sticking out in places. The floor was just deep, sludgy mud. It was wet with water on the top of the clay, with lots of putrid-smelling, rotting leaves, and there was some of that white mould growing against the wall. We were in one corner of an L-shaped pit. If Nico had walked two feet to the side, we would have missed it entirely. We were crying, screaming, I don't know, making the sounds of terror and surprise you make when you find yourself falling into a dark pit. Calm down, everyone, Nico commanded. Calm down. Everyone tried to stop crying. I tried to stop crying. We can get out, Nico said. We can get out if we keep calm and work together. And then there was a light swipe of a flashlight at the rim of the pit. Yes, it was a flashlight and it was bopping around. Hello, Nico called. We all joined in, calling hello, help, etc. Oh my god, Dad, we did it, came the voice of the kid. I knew we'd catch someone, I knew it. Settle down, Eddie, we don't know who's all in there. Help us, Batiste screamed. Then the flashlight flashed down on all of us. Jesus, the man said, it's just a bunch of kids. We were trying to get for, to Denver. We're not trying to rob anyone or anything, Nico said. Oh yeah? Well, we're not going to Denver, we're waiting this thing out, right, Dad? The kid named Eddie said. I hated this Eddie, sight unseen. He's the worst person I'd ever met. One, he laid a trap for us. Two, we'd fallen into the trap. Three, he still had a dad. Yeah, yeah, said the dad. Well, give us your food and water and we'll let you go, the boy shouted. We can't, Sahalia shouted. We'll die without it. Give it up or you can't get out, the kid repeated. Now, Eddie, I don't know, mumbled the dad. We couldn't see them at all, not with the flashlight shining right in our eyes. Max started to whimper. The water's getting into my boots, he whined. Look, Nico said, his clear digitalized voice going up to them. Maybe this seems like a game to you, trying to trap people and take things from them, but we're going to die if you take our supplies. Do you want to be responsible for the deaths of six kids? Max and Ulysses are seven years old, for God's sakes. 
They had to let us up. The lights went out of our eyes and we heard them arguing. Dad, we need the water. But I didn't think they'd be kids. What about Mum? She needs the water. Dad, I'm so thirsty. It was clear who the boss was in their family. Eddie, the meanest kid in the world. We couldn't hear the argument as well as then because Max started crying hard. The water was burning his ankles and feet. Then a light shined back down and the man said, I see your point, son. Thing is, if we don't get your food and water, we're going to die. Max's cries turned into wails and then I heard a vicious shriek. It made me feel el elated and sick to the stomach at the same time. Josie's war cry. And the lights went off us and we heard the fight. She attacked the dag first and had him down and I guess was pounding on him. And then I think the son tried to hit her with something and there was a thwack and the kid was crying. No, please don't. And then Josie roared at him. Well, go on then. Her voice sounded like a monster, but she let him go. Go! As much as I hated the kid, I didn't want him to die. And more than that, I didn't want Josie to be the one to kill him. And the dad, was he? I heard sobbing then, Josie's voice ragged and desperate. And then the sound of her standing up in the mud. Josie, Josie, it's not your fault, shouted Nico. You can stay, Jojo, you can stay with us. I can't, said Josie, dark and tortured above us. Josie, Nico cried, I love you, don't go. And then nothing, she was gone. After a few minutes, the boy came back. Dad, he said. Dad, Daddy. Then the light shined down on us again. You give me an ear mask, he shrieked. You throw it right up now. He started pelting us with rocks and clumps of mud. You give it now. The thing is, we did have an extra. We had three extra. Nico wasn't speaking or moving or anything. Hold on, I shouted. Hold on a minute. I won't hold on. You throw one up now so me and my mum can get out of here or I'll bury you alive. That just didn't seem like a credible threat, actually. He couldn't have been more than 11 years old, and where was he going to get the dirt? But I didn't blame him for thinking illogically. His father was dead. Well, throw one up if you let us out, I shouted. What? I tried to think like Nico. We'll throw an ear mask up if you put a rope down for us. Fine, he said. S throw that. Throw up two, then. Okay, I bargained, but first throw the rope. No way, first the masks. How about I throw one mask, and then you put down the rope, and then I'll throw the second. The boy hesitated. Okay, he agreed reluctantly. He won't throw down a rope, Sahalia scoffed. The mask is an extra, I said with a shrug. We're going to die down here, she said. Nico just stood there. I took Nico's old mask, the one he'd used before he got the good army one, and pitched it up. Now give us the rope, I yelled. This boy, leaning over the edge, shining his own flashlight onto his face so we could see him, said... I hope you all rot in hell. His face was covered with tears and snot. Your friend killed my dad. And he left sobbing. Nico took the gun out of his backpack. Nico, I asked. He looked at me blankly. Nico, I asked again. He was acting scary. He aimed the gun in the air. Help, he shouted and fired. Bang. Stop, I yelled. He was scaring me. He was scaring everyone. Help. Bang. The kids were screaming, help, bang, bang, bang. Nico, don't, I screamed. But he didn't listen. He fired our last shot and then he pitched the gun out of the pit and up onto the slimy grass above. During all this, Sahalia had just lay down in the dank mud and was weeping. Get up, Nico told her. It's no use, we're going to die. No, we're not. Get up, he said through gritted teeth. I'm going to give you a boost and you're going to go and get the ladder. I can't, she moaned. But he did get her to get up. First he tried that thing where one person steps onto the other person's hands, but she was still four to five feet short of the edge. Then he tried putting her on his back, still way short. So then they tried that again, but then I was supposed to climb up their bodies somehow and get on top of Sahalia's shoulders, but that didn't work. I couldn't climb up Nico, just grabbed, handfuls, grabbed fistfuls of his clothing and pulled him backwards until Sahalia fell back too. It's no use, she screamed, we're gonna die. What about the flares? I shouted. We can shoot some up some shoot up some flares and maybe we'll, someone will come and rescue us. Or kill us, Sahalia spat. It's worth a try, said Nico after a moment. I wiggled one of the flares out of the belt. It was sealed in plastic wrapper with a white string hanging off. I pulled the string and scored and a scored middle section ripped open. The flare was cardboard and there was a cap with a sandy surface on it. I studied the flare. It was essentially a large fat match complete with a sandpaper striker attached to the cap 
Before I could light it, though, Sahalia gestured, gestured for me to hand it to her. I'll do it, Sahalia said. I've done it before, and if you do it wrong too many times, it won't light. I handed her the flare. I had wanted to light it, but if she was showing an interest in our survival again, I thought I should encourage it. She struck the cap against the tip of the flare. Then the red light sparked up and molten light spewed out of the end. Sahalia held the flare as far away from her body as she could. Neon orange lit her up. I will never forget the sight of her there, her balaclava pushed away from her face, her long hair peeking through, wearing a yellow, sticker over, yellow slicker over her five layers. Ulysses and Max cowered behind her, each hugging the other for dear life, faces obscured by the ear masks. Batiste formed just behind them, bent over and sobbing, mud and grime all over them, and her, and roots and rocks just jutting out from the sides of the pit. Should I just, like, throw it? she asked. Nico took it from her and hurled it up over the side of the pit and out onto the grass. Nico wrapped Max up in the tarp to try and keep any more water from getting to him. The wet was burning his legs and feet now and he was making this low, animal kind of moaning. Then Ulysses started praying in Spanish and Batiste started praying in English and then it started to rain. That's when Sahalia asked me for my book. Here's what she wrote. My name is Sahalia Werner. It looks like we're going to die and I wanted to write this in case anyone finds it. If you do, please deliver my letter to Patrick Werner. 106 McShane Place, Monument, Colorado. Daddy, I'm sorry I wasn't a better girl for you. If I could go back in time, I'd be up in the morning helping you make breakfast and do the dishes when you asked me to. I didn't know how good I had it and that's the truth. I don't know why we had to fight all the time. I don't know what I was so mad about now. I really can't remember. I want you to know that after the hailstorm I was in the Greenway, right there in our town. I don't know where you got to or if you're even alive, but I was there with all these kids and I love them all now, like they're my own brothers and sisters. I fell in love with a boy there and now he's probably dead. I think you would have liked him, but I don't know. His name was Braden Cutlass and he had the most beautiful brown eyes. I wish I could have been a fashion designer or a singer like I wanted to. I wish I could have lived a life where I moved to LA and made my dreams come true. But that's not the world anymore. Those dreams are dead now. Most of all, I wish you find this, Daddy, so you can know how much that I love you and all I can think of is how much I wish you knew that. I guess maybe you're dead already and you already know what's in my heart. Well, maybe you knew all along. That would be the best thing. Better than I deserve. If somehow you knew all along how I really feel about you. Love from your girl, Sahalia. Here's what everyone else wanted to say. Batiste. Mother and father, if I die, I will wake up in heaven and maybe I'll see you there. Love, Batiste. Max. Mum and Dad, I'm sorry I didn't find you. Be good and don't fight. Ulysses. I am Ulysses Dominguez. Nico wouldn't tell me anything to write. Stop writing in that book, he yelled. We're going to get out of here. Let's light more flares. Someone must be out there. He lit and threw a red, another red and a white. We waited, and the rain started seeping in through our layers. A little while later, Max threw up. He threw up inside his ear mask, and there was a lot of blood. Help us! Sahalia started to scream. Somebody help us! We still had his old ear mask, so now we had to try and switch it out. Nico didn't need to call me over. I, I knelt next to Max and prepared to help. Sahalia was still screaming her head off, and her voice, her voice was going raw and hoarse. Hold your breath, buddy, Nico told Max but he was gasping and choking. Nico took the ear mask off. Max's face was a mess. Red splotchy blisters all over the area around his mouth and nose and eyes and blood dripping from his, chi and blood dripping from his chin. I pressed the new ear mask over his face and he gasped in. The sound was muffled. It was a horrible sound. Max was going to die. Nico gave an anguished, frustrated cry and he jumped up like he'd been stung into action. He turned to me. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to throw you up and you're going to grab onto the edge and scramble out. Okay, I shrugged. I was crying. Max was going to die. Nico made that cradle with his hands and I put my foot in it and he tried to heave me up. It took a couple of tries to get the angle right. I got up pretty far on the fifth or sixth try. I grabbed some grass out over the edge, but it was so slick. I wanted to keep trying, but a root scratched me in the face and I was bleeding. Nico started to pray. I didn't want to see that. Oh God, he said, please God, please send some help because I can't do it alone. Sahalia leaned forward and hugged Nico, her body pressing down on his, and I went too, 
And there were two groups then, Sahalia, Nico and I, and Batiste, Ulysses and Max. And then came a tiny, hey, an old voice, but mad. Who set off all these flares, hello? Then we were clamouring. I jumped up. We all hollered and yelled, but Nico yelled at us. Be quiet, be quiet if you want to live, shut up. Then Nico shouted up. We've fallen in a pit. Don't come cl too close or you might fall in. I won't fall in. I'm not stupid, came the voice. Then a blinding light flashed down on us, going from one kid to the next. Jesus Christ, the voice cursed. You went and fell in the foundation? This family made it into a trap, Sahalia snarled. They laid cloth over it and trapped us. Nico shushed her. Please, if you could just help us out. We're a bunch of kids and one of us is really hurt. The Mandries, that's who set the trap. Looks like one of them got the tar beat out of him too by the look of it up here. Yes, a girl named Josie did that, Nico said. She's O, I shouted. Looks like Ted Mandry's dead here. Please, mister, can you help us out, Nico called. Well, I'm not a savage, he yelled. Of course I'll help you. There's a ladder right here for heaven's sake. There was a ladder up there, right there. I'll help you out, but that's all. Now you shut up and give me a moment, the man said. We don't want to be attracting attention these days. There could be any number of nutballs out here. We huddled together, excited and relieved and still terrified of everything. The only sound was of Max moaning and crying and Ulysses and Batiste sniffing, I guess. Then we heard a wet sliding sound. It was the man sliding the ladder across the ground. That's it, Nico called softly. I know, the man grouched. Inch by inch, we watched the ladder poke further and further into our airspace. It's taking long because I'm old, the man said. I'm too damn old for this nonsense. The ladder started to tip. It's going to fall now, watch out. We're clear, Nico called. The ladder wobbled for a moment, then came crashing down. The man was tiny. He was maybe the same height as Ulysses. I couldn't see his face because he had a red and black checkered scarf wrapped around it. By the way he moved, you could tell he was very old. He helped Sahalia out first, and then she turned and helped us out one by one. Nico came up last, carrying Max. He slung Max onto the wet, muddy ground. There was the body of the dad. He was lying on top of a rock. He had fallen on it during his fight with Josie, and he must have broken his neck, because his head was cocked to the side, and he was looking up to the sky with an open mouth, like he was stargazing. But no, he was not looking at the sky. He was dead. The earth was torn up in places, mishmashed with footprints and some dark brown slicks that were most likely blood. All right, the man said. Good luck to you then. And he started to shuffle away. Please, Nico said. We need to get somewhere safe so we can take care of our friend. And we need somewhere safe to rest. Well, I can't help you, he spat. But we're so thirsty, whined Batiste. And Max is so sick, Sahalia added. Please, mister, please. And we all started in, begging him. Please, please. I knew I shouldn't have come over, he growled. I just came to take out the trash, see? And then I saw the flares and I thought to myself, ignore it, Mario. You're going to get sucked into helping someone and it will be a strain on your resources. But here I am. We must have looked a pitiful sight to him, all of us wearing filthy, matted layers of grimy sweatshirts. Me, Sahalia and Batiste with our faces uncovered, coated with mud, and the only clean parts of being the trails made by crying. Nico standing with his head hung, Max lying, moaning on the ground, wearing a bloody ear mask. Ulysses catching Ma clutching Max in the mud. I'll give you a day and a night, that's it, he snarled. Some basic medical to fix you up the best I can. Three meals and one night's sleep, but that's it. You have to swear to go after that. Nico stuck out his hand and said, we swear. They shook. Everyone started thanking him and Sahalia hugged him. Well, follow me and keep quiet about it, he grouched. He led us across the street towards a smaller development we had already passed. What's he got now, Burns? The man asked Nico, who was carrying Max. Max was whimpering with Nico's every jostle. Blisters, Nico answered. The old man was hurrying as fast as he could, but old people walk slow. He led us towards a house that was, it was that pretend English style with the wooden beams, trying to look like a Shakespearean house. I thought we were going inside, but instead he kept on going. He went across his back lawn to a little building. It looked like a little garden shed. A little too big for a garden shed, but that's what it looked like. We went in and there were tools hanging all along the walls. Come in, he crabbed at us. Shut the door behind you, for God's sake. This is a secret place. I couldn't read Nico's expression through his ear mask, but I was worried. Did the old guy think we would be safe in a garden shed? And then Mario bent over and picked at the edge of a rubber mat on the floor. It looked like a welcome mat, sort of, but it was old and scuffed up. 
He lifted it, and there, underneath, was a metal handle sunk into the floor and a seam. He pulled on, he pulled up on it, but he was winded. So Harlia and I stepped in to help. Hold on, hold on a minute, he said. He addressed us. When this door opens, you go right on down the stairs. They're steep, so be careful you don't fall. Keep going so you're out of the way for the next person. All right, go, he told Sahalia and me. We pulled up on the handle. It was really heavy for the first moment, then a hydraulic lift had kicked in and it rose up by itself. Up above, everything was grimy and dirty and dark, but pure white poured up from the below that door. It was blinding, so used to the dark were our eyes. Go now, Mario ordered, get below. We did not worry for a second that he might be tricking us or trapping us. He had so clearly not wanted to help us. Why would he be tricking us now? And he wasn't. As crabby and crotchety as he was, I trusted him right away. I think everyone did. And we were right to. He saved our lives and his mar name was Mario Schetto. Chapter 17. Dean. I got a pharmacy full of Robitussin, Jake bragged to Peyton. We had some whiskey, but I drank it. I like you more and more, Jake. I'm glad you're considering entering the academy. You should do it, Peyton said. We'll get you in my squadron. Would you like that? Sir, yes, sir, Jake responded. Peyton turned to the cadets, who were still awaiting his orders. Well, you heard me. Fan out. Use your lights and be thorough. So how much respect did I have for Jake? Before this? Meh. Yeah, not much. I liked him. You had to like Jake, because he was an affable, charming guy. Everyone liked Jake, even when I hated his guts and wanted to kill him. But I liked him. But with the drugs and the way he just got so lost and depressed, and the fact that he'd left us... Well, he'd fallen really far in my eyes. Now seeing him play this game with Peyton and watching him carefully bluff and negotiate his way through this nightmare, he was kind of my hero. My shoulder was out. Every step was agony for me. I wasn't going to be able to fight these guys. If we were going to make, this, make it through this alive, Jake would be the one saving us. Too bad you have no lights, Peyton said. Kind of grim in here, dark like this. Yeah, Jake said. We've got a lot of flashlights, and hey, you should see our campfire. Jake led Peyton to the kitchen. I got his strategy. With the fire going, it looked right. It looked cosy and cheerful. You could believe that it was our campsite, as long as they didn't look for our beds. The cadets started coming back, listing what they'd found. Greasy found the chainsaws in the patched hole in the wall. A thin, twitchy guy called Jimmy Dolhands reported in on the water and remaining drinks in the food aisle. And yeah, his hands were weirdly small. They were fairly thorough. Zaremba even found and reported on the oil stain on the lino that tire marks from the tire marks where the bus had stood before it left. But somehow, they didn't see the house. The last cadet came back to report. A strong, burly black kid named Kildo. He looked, he looked like the most menacing of the cadets and carried a semi-automatic. At least, I think it was a semi-automatic. I'd only ever seen them in adventure movies. Was he going to say he'd found the house? If he did, Jake could still play it off, like he was going to tell Peyton, but he hadn't got around to it. Were Astrid and the kids hiding there? I hoped they were up in the roof tiles by now. Anything to report? Peyton asked Kildar. Nope, he said, except a lot of crap and Tupperware in the back corner, and I mean crap, literally. Oh, sorry about that, Jake said, that's the dump. You sure you don't have a girl or two around here? Peyton asked. You saw our girls, Jake said sadly, they went and left us. Well, all right, Peyton sighed, throwing himself down in a berth. Let's party, I guess. How do you throw a party for five crazy Air Force cadets and their little mascot girl in a superstore with no electricity? Rekindle the fire in the fire pit? Cook up some jiffy pop on the flames? Crack open a couple of dozen bottles of Robitussin? And that's what we did. Your arm's all wrong, Peyton observed, examining me across the fire. I hurt my shoulder when I fell, I said. Let me see that, Peyton said. He got up and came over to me. I was sitting in a booth, my back to the wall. I can set it for you. No, no, please, I'm okay, I said. I tried to ch catch Jake's eyes. He was off telling Greasy and Zaremba what, about what the earthquake was like in the store. Don't be a sissy, Peyton said. It'll only take a second. It's fine, I, uh, I lied. Dear God, I prayed, please keep this thug off me. I was scared he'd make it worse, and it already hurt more than anything I'd ever experienced. Come on, just a little pop. Zaremba, killed out, get over here. Please, please, no, I shrieked. Peyton grabbed my hair and brought my forehead up to mine. His forehead up to mine. 
Look, Dean, I know you're scared. I respect that. And you think I'm going to hurt you, but I'm not. I'm going to help you. And once your shoulder's back in the socket, you're going to be very grateful. And that's how I'm going to get you on my side, Peyton murmured to me. See, it's not even about you, really. It's about this gang, my little gang of cadets. See, we're recruiting. He threw his arms out wide, like he'd announced a new national holiday. The cadets cheered. I'm going to recruit you, recruit you by setting your shoulder, Dino. I'm going to take care of you and Jake. You're my doolies now. Get him up, he commanded Kildow and Zaremba. They hauled me to my feet. Please don't, I begged. You don't need to set my shoulder. I'm recruited. Please. But he pulled my arm so that my elbow bent and it was at a 90 degree angle. He pushed my hand towards my other arm, crossed my body, then away, then towards it again, while I screamed and my vision went electric. And then God have mercy on me and everything went black, just as I heard a pop. Chapter 18. Alex. The stairs were white, with black scratch pads on each step to keep you from slipping. Sahalia went first, then me behind her. At the base of the stairs was a series of plastic sheets hanging from the ceiling. The long plastic pieces hung down like a fringe. We stepped through them. Lights automatically went on as we entered. We were in an underground bomb shelter. It was a long, skinny space, like a train car. We were standing on one end of it in a sort of living room area, with two couches on either side and a coffee table in between them. An old ratty easy chair sat off to the far side of the couch. Lining the far wall completely was a bookshelf crammed with novels, reference books and board games. Beyond the living room there was a kitchenette. It had a sink and a single electric burner and closed wood cabinets. It was hard to see beyond that, but I was pretty sure there were bunk ba bunks back there for sleeping. I put my hand on the wall, cold metal. The whole bunker was made out of steel, although some of the furniture was wood. Batiste and then Ulysses stepped in behind us. Praise the Lord, Batiste whispered, and I fully agreed. Suddenly a machine came roaring to life and there was a strong sucking sound near our feet. Everyone jumped. What is it? Batiste asked me. I sniffed it. The air tasted weird, like ozone. I reached down and felt a long, thin vent at ground level. It was sucking in the air. It's an air filtra filtration system, I guessed. It must come on automatically when it senses impurities in the air. Batiste and Ulysses lay down on the two couches. Nico struggled down with Max in his arms. You two, get off the couches, Mario ordered. Batiste and Ulysses slunk onto the floor. Put the hurt boy here, Mario ordered Nico. Mario unzipped his coveralls, removed them, and bundled them into a rubberized stuff sack. He did it pretty quickly for an old guy. Gotta think here. I gotta think about what to do first, he muttered. He went past the kitchen to a closet set in the wall. What can I do? Nico said. He was standing, hunched over, near the couches, and looked about a million years old. Get his boots off if you can. Nico started to tug at Max's boots, and Max let out a shrieking howl. All right, all right, just let him be for a moment, Mario said, tottering in with two, two of those plastic caddies people sometimes use to carry around when they're cleaning stuff. You know the kind I mean. These were filled with medical supplies. Mario put his hand on the couch and lowered himself down to sitting, so he was perched next to Max. Okay, should be okay now. You kids take off your layers. They're loaded with compounds. You, he pointed to Sahalia. There are trash bags under the counter. Get one and collect all the clothing. Sahalia groaned, but got onto her knees and hands and knees and crawled over to the kitchen. The rest of us, I guess we didn't move fast enough for him. Get on there. Take off your layers. You can't be that tired now. He was wrong. We were more tired than it's even possible to be. We were completely wrung out, each one of us. We started to peel off the layers, moving as slow as zombies. You kids need to hurry. The air filter's automatic. It'll keep sucking until you guys are clean, and that's not going to happen with those filthy outfits on. Mario went over to Ulysses and started pulling, it, pulling a sweatshirt off. I don't think you understand. The air filter's automatic. It'll keep running until all our solar is used up, and then it'll start in on the gas generator. I only have a couple of days' worth of gas. So you kids got to hop up and get these layers off and closed into a bag. Ulysses started to cry. Mario was scaring him. Ulysses had the outline of his face mask etched in red around his face. His tears spilled down his dirty face. Oh, for God's sake, don't cry, Mario said, his voice softening a little. He let go of Ulysses' sleeve. We'll get you cleaned up, son. Just get these clothes off. As the layers came off, we became the shape of little kids again. There was Batiste, his straight black hair matted to his head. Ulysses pot belly hanging out from under his monster truck t-shirt. The t-shirt had something dribbled down the front. Vomit, I think. 
Nico took off his layers and got thinner and thinner. Was he so thin before? He looked like a skeleton. He looked tiny. I had remembered him as being so big and grown up. Now he just looked like a sick teenage boy. It was weird taking off the layers. They felt like a part of me. I felt sort of naked without them. But in the end, I was just wearing the navy blue long johns that were my base layer. I remembered picking them out back at the Greenway. I'd felt so help hopeful then. Dean, if you ever read this, you were right. If I'd known what would happen, how horrible and difficult it would turn out to be, and that Braden would die anyway, that Josie would go wild and run away and leave us, I never would have supported Nico's decision to go. Was it so stupid to think that we could get to Denver? I guess so. What do we do now? We're just stupid kids. Sahalia took off her last sweatshirt and the whole t-shirt came off some, like sometimes happens. I saw everything. Big whoop. We threw the clothes on the floor and Sahalia gathered them up. She put them in the garbage bag and she got out another one for our boots and masks. Mario and Ma had Max's mask off and was opening a little foil pack of pills. I didn't like what I saw. Max's face was mop mottled with blisters. Around his mouth they were the worst. It looked like he'd had some kind of bike accident. Like he'd skidded across the pavement on his face. His eyes were screwed shut and he was stifling his cries. Mario carefully opened up Max's lips and teeth and placed a pill on his, in his mouth. Almost instantly Max's expression softened and his body went limp. Gave him some powerful stuff, but it should be enough for us to get him cleaned up. Do you have Benadryl? Nico asked. It's worked for us in the past. Then Nico staggered backwards and just caught himself before he fell. He struggled to stand. He was on his feet, but barely. Sit down, Mario snapped. You fall on me, you'll crush me. Nico collapsed into the easy chair. That's my chair, Mario growled, but then he took a second look at Nico and changed his, changed his tone. But you can stay there for a bit. Mario fished a pack of pills out of his caddy and tossed it in Nico's lap. Benadryl, take four. He looked around and his eyes caught mine. You there. Can you get your friend a glass of water? Okay, I said. Glasses in the first cabinet there and then there's water in the corner. Not too much water at first, you kids. Take two step sips, then wait a moment, then two more and so on. Otherwise you'll all wretch. I opened the shelves. It seemed like it had been years since I'd opened a kitchen cabinet and looked at the stacks of dishes and glasses standing neatly in a line. I took a jelly glass from the shelf. It had cherries painted on it and a yellow stripe around the rim. Against the wall there was a large spring water bottle on a stand. Can I have some water too? Sahalia asked. Please? Her voice was funny and I saw she was crying. Of course, you all need water right away and food too. We'll get to that. First I have to help this one and you have to get cleaned up. My hand shook as I filled the gla jelly glass. I took two sips. It was so clean, that water. I felt it go into my chest and through my whole parched body. It felt like, it felt like heaven. Sahalia had come next to me and I gave her the glass. She took a long drink. Can we have some too? Batiste asked. I went over to him and let him drink from the glass. Then Ulysses had some and by that time there was none left for Nico. There are enough glasses for everyone, you kids, Mario crabbed. But we were used to sharing, we didn't care. I refilled the glass and took two more sips and then I walked over and gave it to Nico. His hands were bloody and blistered. Thanks, he said, his voice like gravel. Fella, what's your name? Mario asked me. Alex Greeter, I told him. Well, I'm Mario Scherto. You seem to have your wits about you. You want to help me with this one? He nodded towards Max. Max, I supplied. Sure. You, Missy, Mario said to Sahalia. There's a shower in the back. Oh my god, really? Sahalia asked, perking up. It's on a timer. You can each have two minutes. Hot water and everything. But two minutes is all, you hear me? It's well water and it's a good deep well, but the hot water heater takes too much power. Yes, sir. And be smart about it. Use soap and shampoo and scrub yourself till you're clean. Don't waste water. It's the only water you're going to get. Yes, sir. And put your under things in a bag too. The lot of you stink to high heaven. Put those boys in first and wash, watch over them. When they get out, there's clean clothes you'll find in the dresser back there. Put them in some of my pyjamas, you hear? And there's some woman's clothes you can use for yourself. Come on, you guys, Sahalia said, herding Batiste and Ulysses to their feet. No arguments from them. They went off to the back, stumbling with tiredness, but excited to get clean. I glanced at Nico. He was already asleep. Now we're going to try and remove your friend's layers, and then we're going to clean and treat his wounds, Mario said. Do you think you can help me do that? I nodded. Good boy. I almost fell asleep a couple of times, but I helped Mario bathe and bandage Max's feet. There was some trioxidol in one of the caddies. I remembered 
it is a semi-demi-steroid Jake had been taking, handing out to speed healing. This might help him, I said, showing Mario the pack. I said it like a fact, but it was more of a question. Good thinking, Mario told me, examining the pack. Adult dosage is two tabs every six hours. Let's give him half that. So I popped out a pill and put it on under Max's tongue. It melted almost right away. It was still a little bloody in there, in the spit. Sahalia, Batista and Ulysses has had all showered by the time we got Max's feet wrapped up. Wish I had a bathtub, Mario muttered as he finished wrapping Max's feet in gauze. Why? Well, I still got to get Max here clean. He's going to trigger the air filter with all this filth. He lifted the seat of the couch opposite us. The whole couch had a storage space under the seat. Pretty cool. I guess in a bomb shelter every inch counts. The storage space was filled with blankets. He took out a metallic blanket like the one that Nico bought. Dean like the one that Nico bought you, Dean, back at the Greenway after the hailstorm. Do you remember? He wrapped the blanket over Max. Maybe that'll help, he said to himself. Then he tucked one of Nico's sleeping tucked one over Nico's sleeping body for good measure. I got the feeling that he cared more about getting the air filter turned off than he did about their warmth, but I didn't begrudge him that. I could take a look at your air filtration system, I offered. I'm good with power systems. Nope, I don't want you poking around back there. He glanced at a metal door in the end of the bunker. It probably led to a machine room of some kind. Then my stomach growled. Really loud. What's that you say? Mario asked. I didn't say anything. Yeah, you did. No, it was just... My stomach made another sound. You're growling at me. What kind of a thing to do is, is that after all I've done for you? I looked at him. Was he serious? Was it Mario actually mad at me? No, he was joking. His eyes were twinkling. He gave my knee a slap. I tend to read machines better than I read people. Go hop in the shower. While you came up, clean up, I'll get some food ready. It was a feast. To us, anyway. Lentil soup, brown rice, graham crackers and applesauce. Batiste and Ulysses were both in Mario's pyjamas. Sahalia was wearing some kind of baggy dress she'd found in the bunk room. She made it look cool, somehow. I had on a white t-shirt and a pair of grey sweatpants. We sat around the table. The table was just beyond the kitchen, but before the bunk room, and grinned at one another. Mario busied himself fussing in the kitchen, and both telling us not to eat too fast, and also to eat more at the same time. We kept offering Mario some soup, but he waved us away. I hate that lentil soup, he grouched. I'm glad to give it to you. Now I won't have to eat it. More, please, Ulysses said, holding out his bowl. Mario ruffled Ulysses here. He could be nice when he wasn't barking out orders or yelling at us about hot water. Just as we were finished eating, Nico woke up. Mario sent him right to the shower. While Nico was in the shower, Mario decided we needed to get Max clean too. Mario and I stripped Max down to his undies, which was weird since Max was totally knocked out. But he really did need to get clean. He had so many blisters and open sores, I knew he was at risk of infection. Sahalia helped me to carry Max to the shower, where we basically handed him to Nico, who was just rinsing off. Nico held Max while I lathered him up. Mario had taped plastic bags over Max's bandaged feet, but blood from his face and his other blisters went swirling down the drain, along with grit and general filth. I'd had plenty of that too during my shower. Eventually the water went clear, though, and it did take longer than two minutes. Mario looked the other way on that one. Lay him down on the last bunk, Mario directed, when the shower is done. He had sealed Nico and Max's clothes in a bag. Nico walked out of the shower wet and completely naked and lay Max in the bunk. I admire Nico. Sometimes I don't know how he does it. He doesn't seem to care at all that Sahalia could see his naked everything. I would have rather died. The air filter finally turned off. That's a relief, Mario said. The bunks were long and narrow. We could fit two kids on each toe to toe. Sahalia took the first one with Ulysses at her feet. I took the one above them. I got into bed and it felt like heaven. To be safe and warm again was the best feeling in the world. Mario came over and tucked me in. It was cute and I kind of liked it. Mr. Sketo? I asked quietly. Yes. Do we really have to leave tomorrow? I just wanted to know. We'll see, Alex. I don't know. It depends on the power system. If we could stay for a couple more days, I know Max would get better. Mario did that corny old bit where he pretended to grab my nose. You're a good boy. You follow directions and you're polite, he said. Maybe you should think about staying with me. I have enough provisions for two to last us near seven weeks if we're careful. I rather think the mess upstairs will be sorted by then. It was nice to be asked. I said I would think about it. 
but I didn't really think about it. I mean, I did like the idea of working on a system, and I didn't want to go back into the violent, horrible world above, but I didn't really think about it. Not for very long, anyway. Chapter 19, Alex. I totally blew it. I blew it for us. The air filter came on, that's all. It was the middle of the night and everyone was asleep and I knew Mario would be upset that it was on again. So I just thought I would take a look at the system. I figured there had to be a way to shut it off manually. I went quietly to the door to the machine room and it came right open. Then I heard Mario's voice say, Stop! No! But it was too late. I saw what was inside. Now he's packing things. I can hear him in the dark, muttering to himself, cursing. He's bustling all around, opening drawers. A little while ago he was back here in the bunk room taking clothes out of a drawer. He would have let us stay for a few more days, I just know it. He would have let us stay until Max could walk again. But I had to go looking in the machine room, and I saw her body there, all wrapped up like a mummy. His wife, it had to be. The shape of a body is the shape of a body. You cannot pretend you didn't see it or that you didn't recognise it for what it is, even if you really, really want to. Mario scurried over and shut the door. Nosy, 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 he whispered. You had to go poking around. What's going on? came Nico's voice, instantly alert. What's wrong? said Sahalia. Nothing, I said softly. I just opened the wrong door. Everyone go back to sleep. They were quiet after a moment. Mario gestured for me to follow him to the kitchen. He glared at me for a long moment. I noticed he was trembling. And then he whispered, I built this place for us to share, me and Judy. I wasn't going to stay here without her. She couldn't make me promise and I won't do it. I tried to talk to him, to make him understand that I wouldn't tell about Judy, but he just pointed towards my bunk. In the morning I saw he'd laid out all this stuff for us to take with us. A set of clothes for each kid, three new backpacks that were loaded with water, and these protein shakes that you can drink with a built-in straw, so Max and Nico can even drink them on the road. He'd cleaned out our boots and masks. He does care about us, but he's making us leave. Nico took the news very well. He just nodded and said, you gave us more than you said, and we're thankful. While we all got ready, I saw Nico hand Mario a letter. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I bet that it's a letter for Josie. I don't know how Nico thinks that Mario would come across Josie. Chances are she'd find us on the road, but I guess it can't hurt to be prepared. After Mario showed Nico all the stuff he was giving us, Nico thanked him again. Do you have any rope? Nico asked him. What for? Mario asked. I want to figure out a way to rig up a carrier of some kind for Max. I thought I could tie him somehow to my back. At this, Mario got quiet. Well, I was thinking maybe Max should stay here with me. It took us a moment for his words to soak in, and then there was a group recoil, like he'd puked or something. Ulysses cried out, and Batiste shrieked, No! And Sahalia started yelling her head off. I know you don't want to leave him. Mario tried to speak over the loud protest, but it was no good. Simmer down, he shouted. I know you all don't like the idea, but maybe Max would like to stay. Why don't we ask him? From the mat, from the back, Max shouted weakly. Not a chance in hell. So Mario Schietto finally came to understand that we, met, we were not a group that you could divide. We walked. It was better than before. For one thing, the road was pretty flat and straight. And we were also rested, well fed, and had new clothes. Old boots, but new clothes. Mario had told Nico which houses in the development might have a pushchair. Nico had found a good pushchair too, a jogging pushchair. If Max felt embarrassed to be pushed along like a baby, he didn't mention it. He was all wrapped up in a blue and orange Denver Broncos rain poncho Mario had given us. We were walking on a road called Gun Club Road, which seems sort of ominous, but the area there is flat and blah, just mile after mile of nothing. No houses or buildings or rest stops. Of course, there were still cars on and around the highway, and cars were scary. Someone could be hiding in them, so we had to approach each one carefully. But mostly they were moulded over, and everything was quiet. It was deserted. Gun Club Road runs fairly close to the 470, so when we got close to the highway, we would see some clusters of cars on the edge, but that was fine. We walked and walked and walked. At first I had thoughts in my head, but then the trudge, trudge, trudge of my feet on the road was so rhythmic, my brain stopped it spinning. There was one, All there was was one foot in front of the other. We might live, we might die, but it seemed like we'd never stop walking. After many hours, Ulysses asked Nico to tell us Mrs. Woolley's story. I can't, Nico said. Why not? Max asked. It makes me too sad. 
I know why, Batiste said, huffing a little from our pace. You think she's dead? No, Ulysses protested. Mrs. Woolley? Please, Nico, please, I'm so tired, Max complained. Why are you tired? I snapped. You're getting pushed in a pushchair. Ah, okay, everyone, be quiet, Nico said. His voice sounded cold coming through the transmitter and the ear mask. Mrs. Woolley's going to come down this road we're on, he said. Will she be driving? Max asked. She'll be driving a van. What kind of van? Oh my God, she'll be driving a, a Kia Sport van. Red? Asked Max with a sunroof. Red with a sunroof. And she'll say, I was just going to get you at Mr. Sketto's house. I knew he was taking care of you while I got this van. How'd she get the van anyway? Max asked. Well, that's the reason she's taken so long. What do you mean? Batiste asked. She had to earn the money to buy the van. Well, what's she been doing then? Max asked. I don't know, Nico said. He had to push the pushchair up over a little hill and the soggy ground was giving him trouble. Maybe she's been stealing it from people, Max said. Or maybe she dug a pit and trapped some people, Batiste added. Ugh, never mind, Nico snapped. There was quiet for a while and I just thought, step, 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 how much further, Max and, or Batiste or Ulysses would ask. A while, Nico would answer. That happened about 20 times. Step, step, step. Ulysses started crying softly. It wasn't like a cry where he was asking for attention, just pure misery. And suddenly Sahalia's voice rang out. She has a good voice, kind of high and gravely, like a punk rock girl. I think it was a rock song, but it was just a, it was a little hard to tell, just her voice alone in the wind. She repeated the chorus and I sang with her and so did a couple of the others. We sang softly so our voices didn't carry very far in the black air, I don't think. It was a catchy song, kind of uplifting and at the same time sad. Sahalia seemed to have a talent for picking the right song for the right moments. That Was that something I could never do? I thought about that for a while as we walked. I thought about Sahalia. She had changed a lot since I'd known her. A lot of change, it seemed to me, in a short amount of time. Maybe I had changed too. That was certainly possible. But I liked this Sahalia much better than I'd liked the old one. How much further, Max or Batiste or Ulysses would still ask every so often. A while, Nico would say. After that happened like maybe 50 more times, Sahalia hissed. Nico! What? he said. Behind us, she whispered. There was a little dot of light behind us, maybe a quarter mile away. Someone else was on the road. Keep an eye on them, okay? Nico asked. But then, maybe 10 minutes later, we saw another group of travellers ahead of us. They came off the highway and down to our road. They had three flashlights and were showing them all around. Not very inconspicuous, kind of stupid. But they seemed to be moving quickly and soon they were quite a way ahead of us. Who were they? Max whispered. They're travellers, Nico answered, just like us. I looked at Sahalia and we smiled. They're trying to get to the airport, just like us, Nico repeated. I cannot say how far we walked in that last march. If we'd been closer to the highway, I could have calculated it with mile markers. I imagine we could walk a mile in 30 or 40 minutes. When we left Mario's, it was 8.32 a.m. We stopped for protein shakes and water at 11.15. Then we walked again until 1.30, maybe five miles? Well, let's say five miles plus or minus two miles from Mario's where we saw a light in the distance, much brighter than the emergency lights on the side of the highway. This one was shining in a circle, spinning its head around like a lighthouse light. It was a beacon. What is that? Max asked. Are we there? Is that the airport? Are we there? I don't know, Nico said. We picked up the pace. Sahalia smiled at me, a big real smile. Batiste squeezed my hand. You could hear a man's voice on a loud speaker. We couldn't make out the words, but you could hear that it was some kind of a message because the cadence repeated. As we drew closer, we saw people gathered around the light. They stood away apart from one another in small groups. Some groups were just couples and some groups had as many as eight to ten people. Most of them wore layers and face masks. There were a few people raving and acting dodgy. They must have been type AB. We made our way up to the group, slowly edging forward. Nico had Sahalia push Max. I guess he wanted his hands free in case we needed to fight. He was probably wishing he still had our, had our gun, but I didn't say anything. No one moved towards us or anything. The people looked as ragged and filthy as we had before Mario's. We definitely looked the best out of everyone, relatively clean, and with, and with two cool orange army face masks, no one else had those. I felt like if Mario could have seen us, he would have been proud. The message came on, on again. 
You have reached an assembly point for the emergency evacuation of the Four Points area. Remain here until the next bus arrives. Buses will arrive every hour on the hour. I was so dazed hearing that. We'd made it. Sahalia let out a big whoop of joy. She hugged me and kissed me right on the mouth. Ulysses went to Max and hugged him and they cried together and Batiste was hugging me from behind as Sahalia, now with her arm draped around my shoulders, gave another big whoop. The other people joined in with her. Maybe it took her relation to set them off, but suddenly everyone was laughing, crying, hugging one another, where before Sahalia had made that sound they were reserved and defensive. And then I saw Nico. He had sunk down to his knees and had his face in his hands. I went over to him. You did it! I said you saved us! Yeah, he moaned, but I lost her. The bus came, just like it said it would, on the hour. Okay, it was twelve minutes late, but who cared? It was a school bus, but painted army green. The door opened, and the driver, not Mrs Woolley, of course, was a soldier wearing an air mask. Welcome aboard, he said with his metallic-sounding voice. We'll have you safe and inside in no time. We filed onto the bus. Somehow Sahalia had broken the ice, and the people from the different groups were starting to talk to one another. A man with a beard asked me where we were from. When I said monument, he couldn't believe it. That's over 60 miles away, he exclaimed. We had a hell of a time and we're just from Castle Rock. I shrugged, but I was happy inside. How did you do it? He asked. It was Nico, I said. I pointed to Nico, who had Max on his lap in the seat across from me. No, interrupted Batiste, who was sitting with me. It was God. The bus went so fast, Dean. The road was entirely cleared. We were in a military zone now and everything was different. When we passed through pl the places with big stores and office buildings, it looked like there'd been a war. There was bullet spray on the walls and burned out jeeps and some of the buildings were on fire. I saw bodies stacked into a great long pile. For burial, I hope, not burning. Though I guess at this point nobody cared. The closer we got to the airport, the more cars there were. All the fields around the airport were just filled with cars. Cars parked at crazy angles, not like a big tidy parking lot, but like a jigsaw puzzle, crammed in every which way. Large drifts of the white mould enveloped the cars in places. The moss grew in waves up and down, ebbing and flowing through the cars. It looked like an art installation, actually, an ocean of bo car bodies and mould. And there was Den Denver International Airport, its white peaks lit up from inside, rising up out of the car field like a castle. Everybody cheered. Well, not everybody. There were people like Nico who seemed terribly sad or deeply in shock. But Sahalia and the kids and I cheered and many other people joined in. We pulled up at a set of glass double doors. We'd made it, Dean. We made it to the DIA. Chapter 20, Dean. I woke up on a satiny bedspread on the floor. Around me came the snores of the other cadets. I tried to sit up and my body protested plenty, but the screaming, brain-holing, drilling shoulder pain of the day before was gone. I couldn't figure out what time it was. Was it morning? Night? From across, across the space there was a light shining. I squinted. It was Kildow, I thought. He seemed to be reading something. I closed my eyes just to rest them for a second. And then I was being nudged awake by a boot. Peyton looked down at me. He carried a mug of water and was brushing his teeth. How's the shoulder, Dino? Better, I said. Better, sir? Better, sir, I repeated. I groaned, sitting up, but it was better. The cadets were eating Pop-Tarts and drinking iced teas for breakfast. Show us where the batteries and lights are. We want to get a little more light going. Don't they have any generators in here? You know, like those portable ones? Not that we've found, I said. I could lead them to the aisle with the lights, but they'd see all the Christmas lights and the lanterns we were missing. Ah, I thought I saw a generator, Jake said. No, I answered. We don't have any. Yeah, near the leaf blowers and stuff. What are you talking about? Ladies, ladies, figure it out, Peyton said. We're doing physical conditioning in 30 and I want as much light as possible. Then we do a total inventory on this place. I want it listed right down to the last apple. Sir, yes, sir, shouted Jake. Sir, yes, sir, I echoed, late and sounding lame. Dismiss doolies, Peyton said with a fond chuckle. Jake led me towards home improvement. Why did you say we have a generator? I hissed as soon as we were out of earshot. They're going to be disappointed. I was just trying to get you alone for a second, he answered. Look, we're going to have to kill them. It's the only way to keep Astrid and the kids safe. We can't kill five guys, Jake, I protested. 
We just need to get that semi-automatic from the black kid. I don't want to kill five guys, Jake. I, you, you don't know what it's like. Jake gave me a hard look. They killed Brayden, my best friend. They killed him. You think we should just forget about that? Jake snapped. Jake, you're not thinking clearly, I protested. They killed him, and I'm going to make them pay. It won't make you feel better, I said. No, I know that. Nothing will ever make me feel better, he said. He shrugged his shoulders. But we have to keep Astrid safe, so we're going to kill those cadets. No, Jake, I said. We just need to get our hands on Anna. We get to her as a hostage and maybe we make them leave. Jake looked at me, chewing the side of his mouth. All right, shoot. Yeah, that's a better plan, he said. Hey, Zaremba came at a run. Don't make Peyton wait. That's the first thing you need to know. In the space where the bus had sat, Peyton had had his cadets make a little gym. They had brought over the weights from the sports aisle and they'd laid down a bunch of rubber mats, the kind you locked together. Jake had snatched some of the battery-powered lanterns from the house. We could have just told them about, about it at the beginning. It was like a time bomb. When Peyton found out that the, ha was hidden, the house was hidden away, he was going to lose it. Jake set up the lanterns and I brought some car batteries and clip-on desk lamps in their boxes. I told Peyton I thought there must be a way to jerry-rig them to the car batteries. Now there's some resourcefulness, look at that, Peyton commanded the cadets. Thank you, sir, I yelled. Every time I did that I felt like a phony and a fraud. Because of my arm, my gimpy arm, as Peyton put it, I was excused, excused from physical conditioning. I worked on getting the lights set up while Peyton put Jake and the others through a grueling, grueling routine of weightlifting and cardio. That's it, Simonson, he hollered. Get under it. Come on, Zaramba, push. Jake actually seemed to be enjoying it. I saw Anna drifting towards the girls' clothing section. I put the light down. I would follow her into the aisle and I would grab her, but the thought made me sick to my stomach. But to save Astrid, I could do it. Where are you going? Peyton demanded. N n nowhere, I stammered. Peyton crossed to me in three strides. He grabbed me by the shirt front. Anna is off limits, you hear me? No one touches her. No one thinks about her. Got that? He got up so close that the spit from his mouth sprayed me in the face. His teeth were yellow and his breath minty fresh. S yes, I said. Yes, sir. I tell you what, you have so much time on your hands, why don't you make us some lunch? What is it about me that screams cook? I went to the food aisles in the exact opposite direction of where Anna had headed. What could I make these idiots? And what could I cook over a brass fire pit? Soup, I decided. Chunky soup, the kind who has the little hamburgers in it. Peyton had liked that. We had some saltines, too. I didn't even hear her coming. She touched me on the shoulder and I turned and Astrid was in my arms, holding me to her. What, where are you hiding? I whispered when, I, when it ended. It's not safe, Astrid pointed up. I just had to give you these. She pressed three foil packs into my hand. Sleeping pills. The easy melt ones. The ones that had knocked Chloe out for a day and a half. We used one on Luna and I thought, of course, sleeping pills. It's brilliant, I said. Now go. She took my hand and led me to the next aisle and I saw the tile ajar in the ceiling. I could see Caroline and Henry and Chloe peeking out. They looked tired and scared and grimy. Caroline gave a little wave. Astrid brought her face close to my ear and whispered, Look, I want you to know that you're... You're the one for me, in case we die. I want you to know. And as lightly as a cat, she climbed back up the shelves and up into her nest in the ceiling. I rushed into the next aisle. I had to get the pills into something, and fast, but not the soup. It would be hot, and no, they might not all eat it. Juice, there it was. That kind with the carrots and vegetables in it. Yes, yes, yes. It was sweet, really sweet, but had veggies, so if it tasted a little off, I grabbed two large bottles and took them back to the, to the back of the aisle. I hoped that if someone came looking for me, I'd have time to hide the pills. I unscrewed the tops off two bottles and started pressing the sleeping pills out of the packs. There were eight pills in each pack, and I had three packs. Well, two pills were out of one of the packs, but it was still a lot of pills. My heart hammered in my chest as I popped the pills into the juice. Twenty-two sleeping pills, eleven in each bottle. Twenty-two sleeping pills to fell five cadets, and to save our lives. Chapter 21, Alex. It's hard to describe how huge the operation at the airport was. First we went into a waiting area for all new arrivals. There were about 200 other people when we got there, and every 10 minutes or so another busload would, arri would arrive, adding 5 to 20 people. They had taken seats from the airport gates and put them in there. 
They weren't bolted to the floor so they wobbled, but they'd been ba they basically made a big waiting area. Everywhere there were signs. Everyone must, must wear a mask at all times. There were air masks piled on the tables. Some were used, some were new. There weren't any army ones like our two available, but there was a different kind, like an army issue mask for civilians. I found one for me and for Sahalia and Batiste. I put mine on and there was a distinct smell of some kind of fruit. I hated that smell, but I couldn't remember what fruit it was. Ugh, Sahalia groaned. Why do we need these? The damage has been done for God's sake. But we wore them, everyone did. Because if you didn't, an army guy with a rifle would come over and shove one into your hands. I think they made us wear them for the sake of the type ABs. Obviously the type O's and A's knew to keep their masks on. But I had seen some ABs paranoid and wild-eyed on the bus. I guess some ABs were functional enough to get themselves to safety, but not rational enough to keep a mask on. With a mask on, those same crazy people looked sedate. Exhausted and worn out, but sedate. It was an unreasonable assumption for me to make, but in some part of my brain, I thought that as soon as we got to the DIA, I would find our parents, like they'd be waiting right by the door or something. But I scanned every masked face in that waiting room. Each of us did, except Max, who was asleep in his pushchair. They're not here, Batiste said, voicing exactly what I'd been thinking. I know, I said, but maybe inside. Our little group all sat together in some chairs. A team of soldiers in hazmat suits with, get this, Pads and paper came around and wrote down our names and addresses and social, social security numbers if we knew them. Is there some kind of list, I asked the man who took my information, of the survivors, of the people who are here now? We're putting it together, kid, he said. I couldn't really see his face, but he sounded tired. He put a bracelet on my wrist. It had a number. He wrote the number down on the pad next to my name and also had an old-fashioned handheld scanner, which he used to scan the barcode on my bracelet. That was good. I was in the system now. All of us were. That would help our parents find us. It had to. The network's still down? I asked him. He held up the yellow pad. What do you think? He was ready to move on, but I put a hand on his arm. He pulled it away. My brother and four other kids are stranded back at the Greenway and Monument, I told him. We would need to organise a rescue. He snorted. You can write a request, he said, but the chances are slim. Why? I asked. We're spread real thin in case you hadn't noticed. But they can't come out because they're O and they're kids and they need help. He'd lean down and put his mask right up against mine. He had brown skin and dark eyes. A kind face but a tired one. You know how many refugees have come through here? He asked me. Me neither. Nobody does. We lost track. But more than 800,000. 800,000 people, kid. We can hardly take care of the people we have here. We don't need to go getting any more. When he said those things to me, I cried. I knew he was right, and I knew we'd never get anyone to go back for you. I cried then, good and long. Sahalia held me like I was a little kid, and I didn't even care. We wouldn't be able to go back for you, Dean. Every 45 minutes, a soldier would come and shout out a bunch of numbers. People would look at their bracelet to see if it was their number being called. Then the ones called would stand up and take all their stuff and go to the big double doors. It was always 30 males and 30 females. We had been told we'd all be decontaminated in a big group shower and then given new clothes and gear. After a while, we waited for a while and then it was our turn. We stood up and went over to the door with the other people whose numbers had been listed. Sahalia took my hand and held onto it tight. Nico pushed Max in his, wheel in his push chair. He looked scared. They had two soldiers in hazmat suits checking names off a sh shared master list. When it got to us, they stopped Nico. That kid needs to go to medical, one said, pointing to Max. But we'd seen people get taken away to medical. They were separated from their families and had to go alone. Max had outright refused. He's okay, Nico said. I can take care of him. Suit yourself, answered the soldier. Nico picked Max up and carried him in, leaving the bloody, mucky whip push chair to the side. We were now in a weird, flexible hallway. It was tall and oval-shaped, like we were in a vacuum cleaner hose. Airtight, obviously. It was big, too. Three people could easily walk side by side in it. A little way down, the hallway branched in two. The men, boys, and the women and girls were being separated. Sahalia started to panic. Don't worry, I told her. We'll find you on the other side. Promise? Promise. Really? She said, her fingers clutched onto my jacket. We'll find you, Sahalia, I vowed. She nodded with tears in her eyes and went off the, with the women and girls. 
We were herded into a big, big bubble room. It was shaped like a giant tangerine, and the things dividing the segments of the tangerine were flexible, white plastic pipes. There was a circle of them around the room, and each came up to the centre of the bubble, where it hung down with the shower head on the end of it. Five large bins with lids stood in the corner, next to a stack of plastic stools. Four more soldiers in hazmat suits were waiting for us. A soldier set a plastic stool in front of Nico for Max to sit on. That was kind. He did the same for a couple of other people who looked worse for wear. Leave your masks on, one commanded us. Would we ever get to take them off? The soldier handed each of us a plastic Ziploc bag. Place any valuables and ID you have into this bag and put your name on it. You'll get it on the other side. I slipped my notebook and the digital watch I'd taken from the greenway and my pen into the bag. I didn't have anything else worth saving. The soldier came and wrote my name on the bag for me and put it into a metal basket along with all the others. Besides the mask, re besides the mask removes, remove all your clothing and place it in those bins. All fabric must go into the bin to be destroyed. That's the policy, the soldier dictated. Some men started to protest, but the lead soldier talked louder than them. On the other side of this room, there is a room filled with clothing and gear. You will have your pick of clean new clothes on the other side. Everything you need will be provided for you. Now get to. Ulysses started crying. It was kind of scary. It was so white and bright. Now this guy was barking at us to get naked. It's okay, Ulysses, Nico said calmly through his voice transmitter. We're going to be clean. It's good. Following Nico's example, we took off our clothes and threw them in the nearest bin. The men around us did the same. There was a grisly collection of bodies, I tell you. We were just standing there, shriveling in nothing but our face masks, when the lead soldier nodded to the other three. They each picked up hoses from the floor. The hoses ran to the base of the walls, and I hadn't noticed them before. This part's going to suck, the lead soldier said. I apologise. Hit them. They turned on the hoses and jets of frothy orange wash came out of them. The four soldiers sprayed us all down. There were shouts of protest and dismay. Then the wash stopped. You can take your masks off now, the soldier directed. He gestured to a bin and we all tossed our masks aside. Most of us had massive indentations on our faces from the masks. Everyone looked sort of googly-eyed and disorientated. The lead soldier nodded again to the other three and they doused us with the foul cleanser again. This sucks, shouted one man. I hate this soap, Ulysses shouted. The lead soldier laughed. I know, kid, but it's the price of admission. He had a large red button on a metal electrical box hanging on the wall. Immediately, hot water started pouring out of the shower heads and spurted out from the pipes running along the walls. It felt like heaven. They gave us thin, scratchy towels to dry ourselves with and blue hospital outfits to wear, like medical scrubs, but made of waxy paper. I thought they were pretty cool, but there was some grumbling from the bigger men. The soldiers led us out of the shower room and back into the hallway. Nico had to carry Max. His feet were bleeding again and he looked pale and wiped out. Get that kid to medical for God's sake, the lead soldier said to Max. Yes, sir, said Nico. We went down the hall and then came out into a large room. A soldier in a uniform, no hazmat suit or ga gas mask, greeted us. Breathe deeply, dent gentlemen. You're now in the safe zone. Welcome. Along the sides of the room were tables. They each said it had a sign of a size like men medium or boys 5T. In the corner there was a bunch of dressing rooms with curtains. Behind each table were two civilians, two women actually. The women were all different ages and dressed in different ways, but I, they all had something in common. It's hard to describe. At first I thought it was efficiency, or maybe restlessness, like they'd volunteered if they didn't get to do something that help, helpful they'd go crazy, stressed, stressed and worn out, but still hopeful. That's when I realised what it was. They were mums. It was like a department store run by mums. Oh man, oh man, did they ever light up when they saw us kids. A forty-something woman in a jogging suit just rushed right up to us. My poor sweet darlings, she said. She held out her arms and hugged Batiste and Ulysses. It seemed both totally inappropriate and totally perfect at the same time. Another mum had me and was hugging me and praying in some language which I don't know what it was. A black lady with red dyed hair that was white at the temples came right out from behind a boy's 10 to 12 table. She just took Max from Nico and then pushed all the clothing and shoes off her table and set him down gently. She started barking orders to the others as she looked Max over. We need underwear and socks and sweatpants for this boy. Nothing binding, nothing uncomfortable, and thermals. Who has slippers? Nanette, bring the slippers. 
The mothers swarmed over the rest of us. They brought us jeans and sweaters and sneakers, everything new. They brought soft cotton underwear and socks with no seams, only the best for us. The men would come in and were left mostly to fend for themselves. And then a really loud, loud voice cut through any, everything. Wu Sanga, Ori Wu Sanga. And a short Asian woman pushed through the crowd of mums. Oma, Oma, Batiste was shouting and he reached for her. She was his mum. He found his mum, Dean. All that we went through, all the horrible things that had happened to us, they were okay. They were for a reason, because Batiste had found his mum. She placed her palms on either side of his face and looked at him. Tears began to run down her face and she didn't even notice them. She just looked at the face of her boy. Then she hugged him tight to her and held him at arm's length again, looking into his face. It seemed like she was trying to drink in the sight of him. Wu Sang Ah! Wu Sang Ah! And that was his name, I realised, his Korean name. Wu Sang Ah. He was our Batiste. And then they started talking Korean both at once. Batiste, duh, is half Korean. I guess I knew that from the shape of his face and his hair and everything, but he had no accent. I never thought he could speak Korean like that. Everyone was hugging and laughing and crying. I mean, all the mums started crying and hugging us and hugging each other. And almost everybody was crying. It was a great moment. Then Batiste's mum tried to take Batiste away from us. She wanted to squirrel him away, take him off to the rest of the family, I guess. Batiste went rigid and refused, saying, Anwi omini! He talked to her in his per perfect rapid-fire Korean, convincing her of something. She nodded. He must have told her that he wanted to introduce her to us. Batiste said our names amid the Korean words. I heard Alex, and she glanced at me and nodded slightly. I bowed, which was a dorky thing to do, and I immediately regretted it, but no one cared. Batiste went on to Ulysses, and Batiste's mum smiled at Ulysses. Max's feet, face and feet got a critical look, and she turned towards Batiste and gave him a mini harangue. Batiste placated her, nodding, and basically telling her, Yes, yes, we're getting him taken care of right away. I couldn't understand his words, but I could see what he was saying, placating his mum and grinning all the while. And then he introduced Nico, and she listened to what Batiste was saying. She was hearing, no doubt, that this worn-out-looking boy with serious brown eyes and the gaunt, haunted expression had saved the life of her son. Nico, ya, yeah, she said, tears again in her eyes. Gompata, nomu, nomu, gompata, Nico, ya. Yeah. She fumbled under her sweater and pulled a necklace over her head. It was a gold necklace with a cross on it, a tiny Jesus there on the cross. Batiste's mother pressed the necklace necklace into Nico's palm and folded his fingers around it. Then she raised his hand and kissed the back of it again and again. Chapter 22, Dean. I screwed the tops on tight and shook them. A little spilled on the top of one of the bottles. I wiped it on my t-shirt. They had to look perfect. I set them in my cart along with the soup and the crackers. I raced over to the paper plate aisle and grabbed some of those blue keg cups. When I came wheeling back to the kitchen, the boys were just finishing sets of frog jumps. They started from a squat and then had to jump up and touch their heels together and then land and do the whole thing again. It looked hard as hell and the cadets and Jake too all looked like they might puke. 30 seconds more, you can do it! I set up the juice on the table and chucked a Duraflame in the brass fire pit. 15 seconds, don't give up! I set the cans of soup on the counter and grabbed a saucepan. Done! Good work, men! There were groans and curses from the cadets as they all basically collapsed. You guys should hydrate, Peyton commanded them. Peyton strolled over to me in the kitchen. He picked up one of the juice bottles and looked at it. I tried not to stiffen. Drink water, Peyton directed over his shoulder. You gotta hydrate with pure water. And he put the juice bottle down and my heart sank. I'd put all the pills in those bottles. Dear God, what if Peyton didn't like juice? Peyton headed off for the food aisles, maybe to find plain water. I cursed to myself. I should have saved some of the pills. Were there more? Maybe there were more in the pharmacy. But then Kildare and Greasy came over. Both were sweaty and thirsty, apparently. Kildare opened the bottle and poured, the, poured a keg, keg cup full. He didn't notice that the seal on the bottle was already broken, or if he did, he didn't care. Greasy grabbed the other bottle and drank right from it. That's gross, man, Kildare told him. Who cares, Greasy answered. There's aisles full of this stuff. He looked at the bottle. Oh, what is this? It's juice, but it's got, like, vegetables in it, I said. It's juice, but it's got vegetables in it, Greasy parroted, mocking me. I shrugged. 
Zarimba came forward, taking the other bottle. He poured a tumbler of it and drank. Tastes good to me, he said, winking. I felt bad. Zarimba was definitely the nicest one. Here he was standing up for me, and I just drugged him. Jay ambled over. What's this? I tried to tell him with my eyes, but he didn't see me. It's too dark. Juice, I said, that kind that Chloe liked. I was trying to tell him somehow that I don't know if the juice had, had the sleeping pills. But then I realised that he wasn't even there when that happened. He'd been out on the road. Jake picked up the container and chugged. Jake! I shouted before I could stop myself. All the cadets looked at me. I tried to play it cool. He's going to puke if he chugs it like that. And somehow I was right. Jake set the bottle down, now only half full, took two steps away and vomited all over the floor. The cadets laughed and slapped one another on the back. I felt like I was going to have a heart attack. Peyton came back hauling two gallon jugs of water. You idiots, he scolded good-naturedly. I told you to hydrate with water. Peyton set the water down next to Jake. Welcome to the Air Force, son. You earned your, you earned your first curl hurl. Laughing, Peyton picked the bottle of juice from the counter and smelled it. Smells off, he said. Peyton hadn't drunk any and neither had the tall, gangly cadet, Jimmy Dolhans. Then Anna came back. There's a room, she announced, sounding as bored as she possibly could sound. There's a camp stove and bunks in the back. It was all hidden away. What? Peyton asked. They hid it from us, Anna said, and there's lots of clothes there and stuff. Peyton strode across the kitchen to where I was stirring the soap. He grabbed me by the hurt shoulder. The pain seared through me and I cried out. A secret? We take you in, we hook you up, we make you part of our squadron and you're keeping secrets from us? He threw me down to the ground and my head hit the side of the fire pit. Sparks flew up into the air. Peyton marched over to Jake. Then, just then, Kildar, Kildar sat down heavily into the, onto a bench. Peyton grabbed Jake by the hair and dragged him to his feet. What else you need to tell me, Jakey? He screamed. Peyton, please, Jake pleaded. I'm sorry. You're sorry? We meant to tell you, but then it was too late. Yeah, it's too late, Peyton shouted. He punched Jake in the face. Hit me back. Hit me back, you lying sack, and then we'll see what happens. Jake was bleeding from the nose. His head hung down. He looked defeated. You won't hit me back because you know that I will destroy you. Peyton kicked Jake in the side and he fell to the ground. Jake didn't move. He was out. Then there was a heavy thwomp, a, the kind of sound, and Greasy had passed out. Zaremba groaned and fell to his knees and then face forward onto the floor. What the hell? Peyton hollered. What did you do to my men? He looked up and looked at me. Uh, it must be the juice, Jimmy stammered. You and me didn't have any. Grab him, Peyton shouted. I tried to get away, but Jimmy caught my leg and tripped me. Peyton snatched a handgun from a pile of the cadet's gear. Then he grabbed me and slammed me down onto the top of one of the tables in the pizza shack. It was the same table I'd hidden under with Astra during the earthquake one million years ago. Peyton pressed the gun into my eye socket. I should never have trusted you, Dino. You got that look of a freaking intellectual about you, you know that? What did you do to my boys? Why did you keep secrets from me? Then there came two delicious sounds. First a scream, Uncle Peyton, from Anna. Then the roar of a battery-powered chainsaw. Astrid stood in the middle of the fallen cadets out on the gym space. She held the chainsaw in one hand and in the other she had Anna by the hair. In the darkness behind her I could see the little kids. You get away from Dean, she commanded. Chapter 23, Alex. Where were you guys? Sahalia shouted. I've been waiting for an hour. I thought I'd lost you. She looked small and scared. I always thought of her as being so mature, but now she looked her age. The same age as me, that is. Thirteen. She was wearing a pair of blue jeans and a large sweater. Her hair pulled out of her face. She looked squeaky clean. She only forgave us when we explained about Batiste and how happy he looked going off with his mum. After we got clothes, we were each given a backpack. The backpacks were white, with no logo at all. They had inside them a little dot kit with a toothbrush, toothpaste, a razor and soap. Also some basic first aid stuff. Wound wash, band-aids, antibiotic ointment and a foil pack of pain pills. All the food vendors, Wolfgang's, Burger King, Pizza Shack, etc. had been turned into mess halls. The food was the same, from what I've been told, for every meal. Oatmeal for breakfast with fruit if you got there early enough. Beef stew for lunch. No one there was a vegetarian, I guess. Chicken stew for dinner. Rice on the side. Oranges for dessert. Sometimes apples. 
There were boxes and boxes of bottled water to drink. We stood there a little lost. People bustled around in every direction. I scanned the faces passing by, hoping to see one of our parents. If I could find them in time, they'd make someone go back for you. But it was useless. There were thousands of people milling and pushing past. Look, Sahalia said. She pointed up to a big board. It had numbers listed in batches, along with hours of departures and gate information, like 7989-8425, gate 7B7, 11.45am. Our numbers weren't even on the board yet. Let's get food, Nico said. He was carrying Max on his back, piggyback style. And then I'm going to get you guys to the gate. And what are you going to do then, Sahalia asked, sounding edgy. I'm going to find someone and organise a rescue. I looked at Nico. I couldn't read any emotion on his face. Do you mean it? I said. Of course. Before I could get excited, Max threw up. It was pure bile, a weird neon green colour. His eyes rolled in the back of his head and he started to shake. People screamed around us and made a commotion. A big guy helped Nico to get Max down onto the ground, but Max was still shuddering and shaking. We need a medic, someone shouted. We need a medic here. Grown-ups were all over us now and we were getting pushed apart. Clear back, shouted a woman. Clear back. She was a reservist. We'd seen lots of them on the side of the airport. Their uniforms were a little different from the regular army soldiers. She pushed the adults back with one arm and with the other she escorted an overweight medic. He had a satchel full of medical supplies and a red cross painted on his uniform. He removed a syringe of some kind and shot it into Max's arm after the shaking and the shaking stopped. He's going to be okay, the medic said. All right, you heard him. The boy's going to be fine. Everyone get to your gates. We need to get you out of here as soon as possible, folks. This is an evacuation, not a sideshow, the reservist bellowed. She had grey hair pulled back in a bun and was much shorter than the other soldier, but she was clearly the boss. She wore camouflage fatigues and had three bars of a sergeant on her arm. Then Ulysses asked her something in his heavy accent. His eyes were wide and he was pointing at the lady. I couldn't believe what he was saying and I turned to see the lady reservist's face. Ulysses repeated, Mrs. Woolley? And it was. It was Mrs. Woolley, Dean. I said it right there on her uniform. Woolley. She looked at Ulysses blankly for a moment. Her face just wiped clean of all emotion and then she shouted, Ulyss Ulysses Dominguez? She looked at him, at Nico, at me, and Max and Sahalia, and then she gave a kind of screech, a giant triumphant screech. And she hugged Sahalia, nearly lifting her off the ground, and then she hugged me and Nico and Ulysses. These are my kids, Goldsmith, she shouted to the medic. These are the ones I've been telling you about. No kidding, he said, already at work bandaging Max's feet. Really? From Monument? Ulysses got down next to Max and was trying to wake him up to show him that we'd found Mrs. Woolley. Max's eyes fluttered open. Look, Ulysses crowd, Mrs. Woolley. Max looked up at her. He started to cry. Why didn't you come for us? Oh, Max, I tried, she said. We waited and waited, Max wailed. Mrs. Woolley pressed her hand to Max's forehead. I tried to come for you, buddy. I put in a request for my CO, but that didn't look like it was going to pan out. So I've been asking every choppy chopper pilot I meet if he would just sneak me over and go and look for you, but no one would do it for me. The medic finished wrapping Max's feet. He patted Mrs. Woolley on the shoulder and headed off. Sahalia was looking at Mrs. Woolley with an emotion I couldn't read. Anger? Contempt? We needed you, Sahalia said accusingly. We lost. We, we lost people. Braden got shot. If you had come... She couldn't finish the sentence, but she didn't really need to. Mrs. Woolley pushed some hair out of Sahalia's face. She took Sahalia's hand in hers. Oh, Sahalia, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that whatever happened. It must have been horrible, honey, she said in her gravelly voice. I made it to the high school and I was trying to get hold of a bus to come back for you guys. And there was this little kind of riot there and then this alert came over the radio. I had to report for duty. That's how it is for us. When called to serve, we got to serve. But I swear to you, I've spent every moment trying to figure out how to get you rescued. But none of that matters. You're here. You made it. Nico said you were coming in a Kia minivan, Max said. A Kia? No way, honey. I only dro drive Subarus and school buses. She rustled Max's hair. You should see the Airbuses, kids. A whole fleet of A380s, loading and flying and loading and flying. You'll be out on the next one. I'm going to see to that. Are we going to Alaska? Max asked. But Mrs. Woolley, I said. You might, she said, but they're going all over. Lots of flights to Canada, Vancouver, Ottawa. 
But Mrs. Woolley, Nico tried to interrupt. They got hit much less than we did, and we've, they've been really amazing. This time tomorrow you guys will be safe. Maybe somewhere sunny even. Max and Ulysses looked at each other and smiled. But Mrs. Woolley, I yelled, we have to go back. Go back, she said, puzzled. Dean and Astrid and Chloe and Henry and Caroline are still at the store, I said. She went white and said, oh hell. Mrs. Woolley grabbed the first reserver she saw. He was a young guy chewing gum and had a long neck and the kind of head that bobs a lot. She took him off to the side and gave him a bunch of directions. She looked serious. He looked half irritated, half amused. Then she came back with this guy. Kids, this is Frank. He's going to get you on the next plane out of here. What? I said no. I'm going to do the best I can to get your brothers and the others. But look, she told us, leaning closer. You've got to get out of here now. It may not be safe for much longer. What do you mean? Sahalia asked. What's happening? Nico said. Just go with Frank, Mrs. Woolley ordered. He'll get you guys on the next plane out of here. I have to go. And with that, she started running, running away from us. Frank grabbed a wheelchair for Max and deposited him in it. Follow me, squirts, he said. He went and looked at the call board and said, Gate A40, and then, all right, let's get this done. Nico looked pissed. Sahalia looked scared, and I was just puzzled. We all just followed along as Frank led us to the elevator and then down to the shuttle train. My mind was catching up to the moment. What had she meant that it might not be safe for much longer? We waited on the shuttle platform. I guess I was in a daze. A shuttle came and I tried to get on. Frank pulled me back. Look, dummy, he said, pointing to a sign that read, Restricted. Military personnel only. The soldiers in the car were all talking to another, one another and asking one another questions and checking their gear. They were excited, anxious, stirred up about something. But what? Our shuttle came and Frank pushed his way in with Max's wheelchair. The rest of us jammed in there with them. I asked Frank, what did Mrs. Woolley mean? It's not safe. I can't tell you, he said. Sorry, kid. Nico caught my eye. He probably doesn't know, Nico said dismissively. He probably doesn't even have security clearance. What do you know about the military? Frank snorted. Are reservists even in the military? I asked. You're not even in the army. We are too in the army, Frank protested. Then why don't, you why don't they tell you what's going on? Nico taunted. Operation Phoenix, Frank said indignant. A battery of thermo thermobaric bombs. Detonation sites all over NORAD and Colorado Springs. They're gonna burn the air? Nico gasped. Yeah, big time, Frank clucked. Gotta try and incinerate the compounds because they're starting to spread. It's called thermal oxidation, you little twits. What are you guys talking about? Sahalia asked. Nothing you need to know, Missy, Frank said. He thought he was so cool because he'd shocked us into silence. At the gate, a soldier was making an announcement over a megaphone. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin boarding. Please make one long line right here. Seating is open. Keep families together. No pushing or shoving. We got in line. Ulysses and Max were play playing around with the wheelchair. Ulysses tilting Max back and Max laughing like crazy. You can leave us now if you want, Nico told Frank. Nico made himself look like he thought Frank was a big shot somehow. I mean, you must have a lot to do. Yeah, I do, Frank muttered, cracking his neck. I'm not here to babysit. We can get on the plane ourselves, I said. All right then, Frank agreed. agreed. Good luck, squirts. And he took off. I'm not going, I whispered to Nico as soon as Frank was out of earshot. I'm going to find Mrs. Woolley and help her organ and help her organise the rescue. Nico didn't say anything. If you think about it, I continued, one woman trying to get a rescue operation going for some kids, who cares? But if I'm there, I'm the brother, I'm a kid. It will, I don't know, move people. Nico immediately turned to Sahalia. No, she said. Get the kids on the plane, he said. We will find you. No, she protested. We don't even know where this plane is going. We'll find you, I told her. I swear it. I swear to you we will find you. She crushed me into a hug. Then she hugged Nico too. Don't let this be the last time I see you, she said to me. I won't, I answered. Sahalia turned to Nico and hugged him tight. Thank you, she said to him. I'm sorry for what, I jer what a jerk I was sometimes. You saved my life. You saved it a dozen times, and that's the truth. Then she turned to Max and Ulysses. They were still messing around with the wheelchair. Come on, boys, it's time for us to get on the plane. She pushed Max's chair forward, edging through the people in front of her. Ulysses looked back at us, confused at why we weren't coming, and I heard Max holler, Wait, what? Come on, Nico told me, and we started running. 
chapter 24, 15. Peyton looked up at Astrid. His mouth fell open and he was shocked. I used that moment to get my hand on his hand on the gun. I pushed the gun and his hand away from me and then Peyton looked back down at me and snarled. Our hands were both on the gun and I was flat on my back on the table. I got my leg up and kicked him as hard as I could and I held on tight to the gun. And I shot as he stumbled back and it hit him. I didn't mean to and I didn't mean to and I shot him right in the chest. Peyton fell to the floor. His mouth was open and he was looking at me with a horrible expression on his face. An expression of confusion. Jesus Christ! Jimmy screamed. You killed him! Jimmy backed away from me. Astrid turned the chainsaw off. I sat up, my hands shaking. I had just shot Peyton. Caroline and Henry started shrieking. I didn't want them to see Peyton. I didn't want them to have seen me shoot him. But I couldn't take it back. His blood was pooling out around him. I couldn't stop looking at him. Hey, Astrid said. I jerked my head away to look at her. You saved us. Remember that. Oh, Dean, Caroline cried. I stumbled towards them. She and Henry came forward and hugged me. The twins talked at the same time, asking me if I was okay and telling me how scared they'd been and asking if Peyton was really dead. Jake groaned from where he lay on the floor. Astrid took a step forward towards him, but Jimmy thought she was coming for him. Please, 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 he begged. Don't kill me. I have a better idea, said Chloe, stepping out from behind Astrid. She stomped over to the juice and held up, a, held up the bottle. Drink. I don't want to die, Jimmy sobbed. Oh, for Pete's sake, Chloe snapped. It's not poison in there, just sleeping pills. Jimmy Dolhands brought the bottle to his lips and drank it. All of it, Astrid said. And so he chugged it. What should I do with this one, Astrid said with contempt. She still had Anna by the hair. Make her drink, Chloe snarled. No, I said, we'll just tie her up. She should drink, the little rat. For Christ's sake, I don't know the dosage, I shouted. We'll just tie her up. Chloe looked chastened. This isn't a game, I yelled. These are people's lives. And a stupid sob came up in my chest, just as Jimmy Dolehand sank to the floor. Anna said nothing as we tied her hands, not even thank you for not drugging me. It was almost like we were boring her. She just wandered over to Peyton and stood staring down at him. I felt bad for her. The girl was clearly psychotic. After Anna's hands were bound, Astrid and I tried to wake up Jake. He obviously had retained some of the sleeping pill juice before he puked. I know, I know, Henry volunteered. When our mum needs to stay... I know, I know, I know, Henry volunteered. When, I, when our mum needs to stay awake when she's driving, she has an energy drink. Sure, find one, I said. It was okay. We had time to try it, even if it was a dumb little kind of, kid kind of a solution. The cadets would sleep for at least eight hours. We were out of danger, but we did have to figure out what to do with them. Astrid sat looking at Jake's face. She was studying it. She must have felt me looking at her because she looked up. That was very brave, Dean, she said to me. No, I said I was scared. That doesn't mean it wasn't brave, she said. The thought and thought of Peyton's face after I'd shot him didn't make me feel brave at all. It made me want to throw up. It made me feel how low and made me feel low and dirty and ashamed. What do we do now? What do we do with them? I asked her. Henry and Caroline came back with the drink. I opened Jake's mouth and tried to pour the contents of the little vial in. Jake choked and spluttered. I think it was more the sensation of drowning that woke him up rather than the ingredients of the drink, but who cared? I say we drag them up onto the roof and lock them out, Astrid said, but we keep their guns. Chapter 25, Alex. Restricted area, boys, the soldier said, barring us from getting on the military shuttle. Our mum's in the Air Force, Nico lied. She told us to come and find her if Operation Phoenix was a go. Uh, okay, the soldier grumbled, letting us past. We slipped onto the shuttle and the doors closed right behind us. The soldiers around us paid no attention. Some of them were Air Force, some were Army, some were Marines, I guess. It was chaotic. The shuttle opened up into the sea terminal. They had dedicated it to military flights. Through the big glassy bays, you could usually see a jet blue 7th, 757 ready to take people to New York or Atlanta or wherever. There were military jets, helicopters in all different models, and giant airbuses painted combat colours. At several of the gates, they had small decontamination tents. I guess if anyone needed to come back in, they got sprayed down here. There were also bins with clothing and gear near the entrances from the decontamination tents. Pilots and soldiers were swarming purposefully every which way. Many were wearing flight suits with air masks. 
Nico and I were the only two people who didn't seem to know exactly where we were supposed to go. Hey, said a voice headed for us. Come on, Nico said, and we walked as fast as we could away from whoever it was who had noticed us. You kids! We searched frantically for any sign of Mrs. Woolley. You're Woolley's kids! We turned then. It was Goldsmith, the medic. What are you guys doing here? I thought Woolley was putting you on a plane. We need to find her, I told him. Now's not the time, he said. They move the whole operation up. It's life or death, Nico pleaded, grabbing his arm. Please help us. Do you know where she is? Last I saw she was near gate 33, Goldsmith pointed. You better hurry. We had a direction now and we ran, darting into the stream of pilots and soldiers. There, Nico said, pointing. We came close and heard her scolding. Christopher Caldwell, I've known you since you were a kid. You're going to get in that chopper and you're going to run me over there. No, Woolly, I said. No, for God's sake. I got orders. Orders. They're a bunch of kids, Caldwell, and they're going to be burned to a crisp. A bunch of kids you could save. Think about it. They'll give you a medal. It's a suicide mission. The answer's no. Please, mister. I went close and grabbed his arm. It's my brother, Dean. My big brother, and he's got his great... And he's a great big brother, and he's counting on us. Alex, Nico, what are you doing here? For Christ's sake, you should be halfway to Vancouver. Mrs. Woolley looked mad as hell. I can't go without the others, Nico argued. We just can't. You kids go and get on a godforsaken plane. I'll take care of this. Good luck, Woolley, said Caldwell, and he turned and left. They're little crit kids, I screamed after him. Two teenagers and an eight-year-old and five-year-old twins. Five-year-old twins, and we came all the way from Monument. Can't you help us? Then there was a pilot coming at me wearing an air mask, all suited up to go. He grabbed me hard, and I mean really hard, and he said, his voice all electronic, what twins in Monument? And I opened my mouth to tell him, but he ripped off, ripped off his ear mask and I saw his face. It was Mr. McKinley, our neighbour. It was Mr. McKinley Dean, Henry and Caroline's dad. Where are they? Mr. McKinley asked. They're at the gr Greenway in Monument, Nico said. We left them there three days ago. We hurried along with them. What's the best way in? He asked us. We should land on the roof, Nico told him. There's a hatch and it's easy to open from the inside. There's no we, Mr. McKinley said. Captain, I mean. I'm going alone. What? I screeched. No, we're going too. Yeah, Nico shouted. You kids cannot go, Mrs. Woolley yelled. No way. You need us, Nico insisted. We know how to get into the store. We're probably going to die, Captain McKinley growled at us. No, I told him. We're going to make it. We're going to save them. I knew it in my gut. Captain McKinley nodded and wiped his eyes and gave me a clap on the shoulder. Grab masks, he said, nodding to some canvas bins near the gate. Get good ones. All right, Jesus, Mrs. Woolley said. I'll suit up. We don't need you, Captain McKinley said. Stay here. Help with the evac. I should come, she said. That's an order. But, Captain McKinley grabbed her by the front of her uniform. You want to help? Try to get up to the control tower and get us clearance for takeoff so they don't shoot us out of the sky for deserting. Okay, Mrs. Woolley said, shaken. Will do. She hugged me and Nico and took off at a run. Nico and I rummaged through the bin looking for some good masks. Captain McKinley came back with flight jumpers for me and Nico. Air tight, he said. Get these on. They're dropping bombs over NORAD in 20 minutes. We have another five to seven minutes after that before they level monument. If we're going, we're going now. How long would it take us to get there? I asked as Nico struggled into his suit. In a wildcat at full throttle? 16 minutes. We're going to make it, I said. Captain McKinley's helicopter looked fast. I got to sit up with him. Nico had to sit in the back. Captain McKinley plugged a cord into his mask and pointed for me to do the same. It was a jack into the communications system. I could hear the dispatchers going crazy, giving instructions to the planes and helicopters. Captain McKinley reached over and across me, flipping switches all over the place. The engine roared to life and the propellers started. I was glad for the noise-cancelling headphones built into the air mask. It was loud. Wildcat 185, you are not cleared for takeoff. Repeat, you are not cleared. Mrs. Woolley had not made it. She hadn't made it in time. Tower, this is Captain McKinley going on a rescue mission. McKinley, shouted the voice on the headset. What the hell are you doing? You are not cleared. Sorry, Tower, it can't be helped. Stand down, Wildcat 185. We will open fire. It's my kids, Tower. They're alive. They're in the Phoenix Zone and I'm going for them. Oh, Jesus, McKinley. In the background, other voices were shouting directions to all the other planes, clearing coordinates and assigning them for takeoff. 
Go get him, Hank, the tower man said. God bless you, Wildcat185, you are cleared. And then another voice added, Good luck, McKinley. And another, Go get your kids. Takeoff was bumpy. Visibility is limited, Captain McKinley said to me. It's one hell of a weapon, the ink bomb. Lucky for us, though, we're flying one hell of an aircraft. He wheeled towards Monument, and I held on. And even though I am agnostic, I prayed. Chapter 26, Dean. Jake had a different opinion about what we should do. Look, he argued, the bus is right outside and we know it runs. We should get out of here and go to Denver. But the others could be coming here to rescue us, I protested. Someone should be on the way. Dean, Jake said solemnly. Peyton kicked them out of the bus. They were on foot. There's no way they made it. I didn't want him to be right. Maybe they were still out there. Maybe they had made it. But that doesn't mean we can't get to Denver, Jake continued. We won't stop for anyone. And we have guns. Lots of guns. I think Jake's right, Astrid announced. We should try the bus. What? I asked, dumbfounded. Why? You were the one that made me stay. I know it's a long shot, but maybe we should try and find the others. I mean, they're on foot. And that made me think. At least let's go look at the bus, Jake pleaded, just to see if it works. I was sick of hiding in that dark, cold store. A part of me wanted to get out in the air, even if the air killed me. But it was what Astrid said about my brother that put me over the edge. Maybe we could find them. We lay it up. But we don't want to go outside, Henry protested as I handed him his layers. It's scary out there, Caroline continued. But you'll be with me this time, I told them. And you know I would never let anything bad happen to you. They looked at each other, clearly unhappy about this plan. Are you too crazy? This is what we've been waiting for, Chloe gushed. We're finally going to Denver. We're going to see our parents there and we'll get rescued to Alaska. And Alaska is awesome. Get your stuff on. Hurry. Okay, Caroline gave in. We'll go. I left, them, I left them and crossed to Astrid. We should take supplies, I said. Food, water, lights, a tarp. If we're really going to try and make it. And then I remembered the backpacks I'd packed for Mr. Appleton and Robbie. I strode away from the group into the storeroom. I looked around with my flashlight and there they were, behind a stack of packing crates. I'd thrown them back there after Robbie was shot. We had wanted to, to, to look to the little kids like he had left, so I'd hidden the backpacks there. Astrid, Jake and the kids came in, their headlamps bobbing all over the place. I prayed they wouldn't see the bodies, or that if they did, they wouldn't understand what they were seeing. These are ready to go, I said. Right on, Jake replied. Jake shouldered the heavier backpack. My shoulder still hurt plenty. We had water, food, first aid stuff, some extra clothes for full-grown men, but no matter. Some flashlights. I couldn't remember what else had been packed. And we climbed single file up the stairway to the hatch. We were leaving our greenway, and we didn't have a moment to reflect or give gratitude to it. But of course, we were grateful. Wait! Chloe shrieked through her mask. What about Luna? Shoot, Astrid said. She's still asleep. I'll get her. You guys go ahead. We climbed up. It was dark up there. Hard to see and breathe with the mask on. Hard to move with all the layers on. Henry clutched one of my hands, Caroline the other. We made our way slowly over the pitted roof to the ladder. Dean, you go first, Jake commanded. Then the kids, then Astrid and me. The rungs were slippery. It seemed like there was a fungus growing on the rungs, rubber f on the rungs rubber foot treads. But no one fell. We waited for a moment at the bottom of the ladder for Astrid. Then she came wearing a new backpack. Where's Luna? Chloe asked. Look, Astrid said and turned around. Luna's sleeping head stuck through the top of the backpack. This way, Jake directed us, and we followed him through the parking lot, away from the store. I didn't try and talk. It was too hard with the masks. I was holding Caroline's hand on one side and Henry's on the other. Astrid was holding Chloe's hand and Jake was walking ahead of us. Our little light zigzagged the ground in front of us as we trudged through the parking lot towards the bus. The ground was slick in places. The grass in the little sections near the light poles was all dead. The hail-crushed hail cars were slimy with rust in this weird white foam. No wonder Jake had come back, and no wonder the cadets were so eager to be inside. It was creepy out in the dead world. There was some of the feathery white foam growing on the tyres of the bus. Beside that, it looked fine. We heard it first. A giant boom that made my ears ring. I looked up, over in the direction of Norad. There was a giant fireball in the sky. Woo! The kids yelled. It didn't look far enough away to be fireworks. And then, in the space where the fireball had been, and in a circle around it, there was light. The sun had come in. 
At first I thought maybe this was good. Maybe they'd find, found a way to clean the air. Two more explosions came. They were bombing the sky. And then hot winds rushed towards us over the ground and I knew that we were all going to die. Alex. I saw the village in. I saw the 7-Eleven. We were in Monument. The chopper was equipped with searchlights and there it was, Monument from above. There was the roof of the Greenway. Our roof. I was so happy. I just kept seeing Dean's face in my imagination. He was going to be so excited to see me. The first bomb started exploding in the air above NORAD just as we touched down on the roof. We've got maybe five minutes, Captain McKinley shouted. We all scrambled out of our safety harnesses and raced across the scarred, hail-beaten roof to the hatch. It was actually open, which was weird. But in that moment it didn't seem weird, it just seemed terrific. Getting in was the part I'd been worried about. Nico and I rushed down the stairs. Dean Astrid, we're here! I shouted. And then I saw the little girl. The little blonde girl. She was just standing over the bodies of Robbie and Mr Appleton, her wrists tied together. Little girl, Captain McKinley called, coming down the stairs. We're here to rescue you. Where are the others? He didn't know. He didn't know who she was. You, Nico shouted. How did you get here? Captain McKinley moved past us into the store, yelling for Henry and Caroline. Where are they? I screamed at the girl. You tell me. You tell me right now. She was crying. I was crying. They left, the girl said. They went off the roof. They killed my Uncle Peyton and they left. Inside, I could hear Captain McKinley calling. Henry! Caroline! Captain McKinley, I screamed. He came running. What is it? Where are they? Boom! Came the sound of another bomb exploding over Norad. They're gone, I sobbed. They left the store. His face fell then. It went all grey. Right, of course, he said, hard like a stone. I'm sorry, I cried. Let's move out. Dean. Jake was in the bus trying to get into it, trying to get it to go. But the wheels wouldn't turn through the white stuff. They were disintegrated or something. Astrid was next to me. The children huddled at our sides. We would watch the bombs until they took us. That seemed to be the right plan. Each detonation, sh de detonation shook us and each detonation punched a hole in the sky. They were coming closer. The light streamed in in those pure straight beams. God light was what my mum had called it. I thought of my mum and my dad and Alex and I was full of love for them. I drew Astrid to me. Astrid was so beautiful in her gas mask and all her layers and the little kids too. And Jake, now standing on the steps of the bus, his chest heaving, had his head thrown back to look at the firebombs, was beautiful too. And I thought of how perfect we all were at that moment and had always been. I was ready to die and then Chloe grabbed my arm and pointed back towards the store. I turned and saw there was a helicopter on the roof. I turned to Astrid. Run! I shouted. Alex. The sky had holes in it. The air was hot and windy and it battered us as we crossed the roof. Get in the chopper! Captain McKinley yelled to us. The stupid blonde girl was getting rescued. She who deserved it least of all. Nico gave her a boost into the back. Her hands were tied so she couldn't climb. Captain McKinley and I got in the cockpit. He clicked on the switches and pressed buttons like he had done before. But now he was like a robot. It was his training doing the preparations. The man was gone. He flipped a switch and said over the intercom, Be sure you're strapped in back there. Let her not be strapped in, I thought to myself. Let her fall out and die. Dean. The chopper started to lift. They were leaving without us. The explosions were closer now, coming more frequently. Every few seconds we were thrown off our feet. It was like trying to run in a bouncy house. I tore off my mask. I could use the O energy to run faster. And I felt it, the surge, and I ran. I ran for it with everything I had. Alex. Captain McKinley pushed up on the control stick and the helicopter rose in the air. The air from the bombs rocked and buffeted the helicopter. He had to struggle with all his might to get it to lift. But he did. And we started off the roof against a steady boom, boom, boom. Dean. I vaulted up the ladder four runs at a time. I pulled myself onto the roof and shouted, Alex! I yelled with all my might. Alex! Alex. In a bomb blast, I saw a figure on the edge of the roof. He was running at us. Look! I shouted. It's my brother! It's Dean! He was on the roof. What? Captain McKinley shouted. I grabbed his shoulder and pointed. That's my brother! Dean! 
Copy, sitting down, brace yourself, Captain McKinley shouted, wrestling the control stick. He struggled to set the helicopter back down. Dean came running to the chopper and I pushed the door open and fell out onto the roof and then we were hugging. Dean, Dean, I found you. Then my brother put his head back and roared. Dean, I fought against the compounds. I tried to stay sane. Nico tackled me, holding me down, and Alex took off his ear mask and put it over me. By then, Astrid and the kids and Jake were climbing onto the roof. Alex, get in now, Captain McKinley shouted. No time for hellos. He literally threw his kids in the back of the chopper. Boom, boom, the bombs were getting closer. Dean, Astrid fumbled to strap the kids in. Nico shoved me into a seat and strapped me down. I was trying to breathe, trying to become human again. Good to see you, Dean, Nico said. His voice came digitally right through my army ear mask, right in my ear. Alex made his way to me, crawling over the others. We got you, my brother said. We've got you. Alex. Hold on, Captain McKinley shouted. He lifted the helicopter back into the air. I clipped into the seat next to Dean as boom, searing winds hit us. Captain McKinley wrestled the control stick, battling the winds for command of the helicopter. Boom, another explosion to the right of us. The hot winds almost dashed us back down, but he pulled up and up. And then we were racing into the dark air. We were ahead of the bombs, and then we got away from there, up into the black sky that was splintering now, shot through with direct sunlight and fire, and I held my brother's hand. Epilogue. Dean. We deserve a happy ending. All of us do. And I think we're going to get it. But I'm not exactly sure yet. We're lucky to be here in Quilchena. Yes, we sleep in rows and cots and giant tents. Yes, armed guards patrol the perimeter. And yes, we've had next to no contact with the outside world. But some of the American containment camps are much worse. We hear stories of refugees being locked in prisons and denied all rights. There are some crazy rumours floating around about medical experiments being performed on O-types. The Canadians at least treat us like human beings. They're polite and everything. I feel bad for the poor Canadians. They had no idea what they were in for when they allowed refugees to be airlifted here. It turns out the survivors of the Four Corners disaster, as they're calling it on the news, are violent and unstable. The first refugees they airlifted to Calgary and Vancouver started leaving the temporary housing and tearing through towns and cities, looting and rioting. Now they have us all collected in containment camps and they're negotiating with the American government to see what will happen to us. The Canadians should never have taken us in. Alex has a theory that they felt partially responsible for the chemical weapons program at NORAD because it's a joint venture between the US and Canada. It's 1pm and normally at this time all the refugees gather in the dining hall. After lunch they let us watch TV for one hour. Any more than an hour, they've found that the refugees get too hostile and shaken up. There are a few mini-tabs being passed around, but there's less interest in them than you might think. Alex got a hold of one and discovered that all the data is gone. All our emails, our photos, texts, contacts, accounts, it's all gone. And we have no way to find our parents because their accounts are gone too. It's creepy being on online. A few stupid sites are up, but mostly they're missing pages and endless redirects. It's like the network has been struck with amnesia. Alex has set up new accounts for us. If our parents are out there, they'll find us. I have to believe that. In the meantime, at 2pm, the guards post the most re recent refugee listings, and we all pour over the list, searching for the names of people we've lost. They're listed by zip code and then alphabetically. I just keep praying to see our parents. 80132, Greta, James, or... 80132 Greta Leslie, but so far nothing. No sign of Heyman, Laurie either, or any of Astrid's younger siblings. Ulysses incredibly found his whole family, and they have, to, they have agreed to legally adopt Max if his parents don't show up. Max lives with them now and he loves it. Somehow I feel certain that the Dominguez family will give him a more traditional and morally sound upbringing than Max's biological parents. They're in Tent G, which is all families with young children. Mrs McKinley lives there with the twins. The scene when Captain McKinley brought Caroline and Henry to their mum was joyous and heartbreaking and made everything, everything worth it. Astrid reminds me of it every time I wake up shouting in the night. I still see Peyton's face after I shot him and the pallet loader guy I cut to pieces. Captain McKinley had to return to duty. Mrs McKinley took 
Chloe and Luna out of the goodness of her heart. If we'd had to leave Chloe with us in Tent J, I think I'd go nuts. Mrs McKinley and the kids sometimes take Luna on rounds through the infamy, infirmary. Luna has taken to the role of the therapy dog like a pro. When people hold our face-licking, tail-wagging Luna and hear the story of how she got rescued, all the way from Monument, it seems to give them hope. Luna has that sort of become the Quilchena mascot, and no one is more proud of that than Chloe, who grooms Luna incessantly and walks her about eight times a day. Captain McKinley told us that when he saw Mrs. Woolley at the Fort Lewis McCord Air Force Base, apparently when she saw him she was so happy that he was alive and that we'd made it out safely that first she kissed him on the mouth and then insisted on buying him and everyone else in the canteen drinks all night long. She drank them all under the table, of course. I can't believe Mrs. Woolley made it. Hearing about the moment when Ulysses spotted her at the DIA is one of my favourite parts of the story. Captain McKinley says she's trying to get leave to come and visit us. Alex, Astrid, Sahalia, Nico and I live in Tent J. Tent J is basically for orphans, age 18 to 17. But since I get to be with Alex and Astrid and Nico, I don't feel like an orphan at all. Today we're not at the listenings. Today we're having a party. Mrs McKinley has made a picnic and requested permission for us all to go out into the community outdoor area on hole 3. Everyone else is at the listening, listings, so we have the whole green to ourselves. It's the twins' birthday and they're turning six. It's a beautiful day. There's a pond on this hole, a water feature I guess they call it, and behind it are trees blazing in gold and orange and chestnut brown. It's a very nice golf club here and they've turned it into a prison for, that they've turned into a prison for us. Mrs McKinley has laid out a bed sheet as a picnic blanket and has clearly been saving her food and bartering so that there can be treats for the kids. There's also a bag of potato chips, everyone is careful to only take one or two, and a bag of cheese, doodles, and somehow she's wrangled a package of chocolate-covered donuts. Pretty impressive. Caroline and Henry are playing with their present, a soccer ball. Ulysses and Chloe join and they start playing a little game with two of Ulysses' older brothers serving as goalies. Luna is running and barking and generally getting in the way. The grown-ups sit on the parched grass and watch the game. This almost feels like real life again. Max is watching from a very comfortable position on the generous lap of Mrs. Dominguez. I can tell he'd like to join in, but his feet still aren't 100% yet. Mrs. Dominguez takes him to the clinic and waits in the long queue with him every day so that he can be seen. She's been doing with that with him for the two weeks since we got here. Mrs. Dominguez is combing Max's hair with her fingers, and that cow lick of his just keeps springing up every time. I bet she never thought that she'd be the mother of a kid like that. Where'd they get the ball, do you think? Astrid says as she comes to stand beside me. She puts her arm around my waist and I draw her to me. I think I've gotten used to having her as my girlfriend. I haven't. She glows in the sun. I don't know whether it's the pregnancy or if it's just that I love her so stupidly much. But every time she comes near me, I basically have to shade my eyes. She's so bright and beautiful. But I'm not so shy around her anymore, which is good. And I don't try to be anything that I'm not. I figure she knows who I am by now. The captain must have smuggled it in, I say, nodding towards the ball. No way Mrs McKinley could have bartered for it in here. Alex and Sahalia are sitting on the grass. They're too far away from me to hear what they're talking about, but Alex says something that makes Sahalia roll her eyes and punch him in the shoulder, and then they both laugh. It's weird. I don't know what happened between them on the road. It's not like they're a couple, but they hang out almost every day. Sahalia watches Alex fix electronics that people bring to him, and Alex hangs out while Sahalia roots through the charity bins for clothes. Her birthday's coming up too, and Alex has been bartering to get her a pair of black biker boots she's coveting. Right now, Sahalia's wearing white painted coveralls rolled up to the knees, with the sleeves cut off and a red bandana tied around her waist. She's got flair, all right. I feel Astrid go tense. It's Jake. Jake's coming up the faded green hill with his dad. He and his dad found each other on the first day we arrived. I'm jealous of him because of his dad, but that's okay because he's jealous of me too, because of Astrid. We give each other a wide berth. Hey y'all, Jake calls out. Uncle Jake, Uncle Jake, the kids screech and yell. They abandon their game and run to him, tackling him. They roll down the hill together in a big dog pile. You think Max would be feeling left out, but no. He just buries himself deeper into Mrs. Dominguez's willing arms and lets himself be mothered and fussed over. Now where did I put that present? Jake says to the kids. 
He tickles Henry and then Caroline. Is it under your neck? Maybe it's here in your armpit. The kids are all laughing. Jake pulls out a pack package of gummy bears and the kids go nuts. Gummy bears were no big, big deal back at the Greenway, where we had dozens of bags of them. But now that they're scarce, the kids covet them. He's doing better, Astrid says. Yup, I say. I don't tell her what Alex told me. Jake is on antidepressants and seeing a counsellor. Jake can tell her himself. They talk sometimes. She tries to explain why she chose me over him. He probably tries to persuade her to get back with him. But that's not going to happen. Our plan is that the baby will call Jake Daddy and will call me Dean, and that's fine with me. I don't need the title. I want the position. Hey, hey everyone, Mrs McKinley sings. Is everyone here? Where's Nico? Astrid asks me. Probably at the listings, I say. Nico's the one who's doing the worst out of all of us. He wanders around, not really engaging with anyone. He's not been able to find any word of anyone from his family, and he's still mourning Josie. He sketches sometimes, but he won't show anyone the drawings. Gather around, please, Mrs McKinley calls to us. Mrs McKinley has put two birthday candles in the centre of the two tiny donuts. They share one thin, pa thin paper plate. Before she lights them, Mrs McKinley pushes her long auburn hair out of her eyes. She looks just like the twins, wall-to-wall -wall freckles, light blue-green eyes. She especially looks like them when she smiles, and her eyes crinkle up in the corners. I just want to say thank you for taking care of my babies. I will never stop being grateful to you kids. I owe you. I owe you everything. And she stops because she's so choked up. I don't know how we did it, actually. I don't know how we managed to save them. Alex and I take long walks during the outdoor period for Tent J. We do laps and we rec recount what happened to each us in each other's absence. There's no older, younger between us anymore. We're equals now. We talk about the future. We can't believe we even have one. Looking around our circle, I wish that Nico was with us and I worry about him. I wish Braden had made it. I will always regret the way he died. And poor lost Josie, her last hours must have been horrible beyond what any of us could imagine. I look at Mrs McKinley and her growing, grinning twins. I look at Sahalia, who is still somehow cooler than the rest of us, and Chloe, who is still somehow a brat. And at the brothers, Ulysses and Max, standing with the rest of the Dominguez family. I wish Batiste could be here to stand with them, but he, for he's also our family. But he's in Calgary, we think. I bet Batiste thinks about us all the time. I look at Jake and his dad, who are going to be okay in the end, I think. And my brother Alex, who I will never, ever leave again. And the beautiful Astrid, who I would kill for, and already have. The gratitude I feel swells up and tears come to my eyes. But that's okay, because as Henry and Caroline blow out their candles, everyone else is crying too. A figure is approaching over the hills and grass. It's Nico and he's running. Guys! Guys, he shouts breathless, look! He holds up the front section of a printed newspaper. Printed papers have made a comeback with the interruption of the network. We all pull in close to see. Our headline reads, Clouds of warfare compounds rumoured adrift. Reading that gives me a pit of cold dread in my stomach. But that's not what Nico's so excited about. He points to another smaller headline. Riots at Umo. The subheadline reads, Refugees rise in rebellion at the University of Missouri containment camp. Nico puts his finger on a full colour picture. It's an old guy protect being protected from a guard wielding a night st nightstick. It's Mr. Sketo, Alex yelled. And next to him, shielding Mario Sketo from the blow, is a girl with her hair up in two giraffe bumps. It's Josie. The girl in the picture is Josie. I'm going for her, Nico says, eyes flashing between me, Jake and Alex. Who's coming? The end.